sorry. I think like, the feminists did to, fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Well, uh, good morning to you. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. I'm Julia hartley -Brewer. This is Talk TV. We are back in, well, our old radio studio, which is actually rather exciting and rather good fun. Uh, but no water goose and things like that. So it's just you and me and our guests, and we're actually going to be talking about what really, really matters. But some of the key headlines today to start you off, Rishi Sunak is demanding answers from Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu after an Israeli airstrike killed seven aid workers. That included three British citizens. And the head of the Israel army has apologised for what he called a grave mistake and promised full investigation of the incident. And we'll hear a little clip of what he had to say in a moment. Meanwhile, a record 5,000 channel migrants have already arrived in the UK so far this year, as we learned at the weekend. That is up 30% on the same period last year. Now the Prime Minister has blamed the weather for the increase, which is weird because the weather was the reason why they went down last year, wasn't it? Oh, no, they said it wasn't. And two-year-olds will now be eligible for 15 hours of government-funded childcare in England. But will nurseries be able to hire the 40,000 extra staff they're going to need to cope with that over the next year with the rise in demand for places? Well, we'll talk about all of that. Plenty more, including J.K. Rowling, apparently not facing arrest by the Scottish police, but will other women and men who say will tweet exactly the same things. All that coming up. First, though, I'm delighted to say I'm joined in the studio today uh, by uh, Philip Ingram. Uh, good morning to good you, morning, Philip. Julia. Lovely to have you here. Of course, a former senior military intelligence officer. Couldn't be a better day uh, well, to have you here in the studio to talk about, obviously, the biggest story uh, of the day, which, of course, is events in Gaza. Now, um, very, very disturbing events. The death of any civilian is tragic and awful and shouldn't happen, but does happen in war. The death of any aid worker particularly more tragic because there's the people who have volunteered to go to a dangerous part of the world braver than most souls are probably not braver than you you've been in the military certainly braver than people like me um to actually go to another country to go to a war zone to provide aid to keep people alive desperately needed uh, humanitarian aid and food aid for the people of gaza but we know now that seven aid workers were killed in an israeli airstrike we know that three of those were british uh, their names have been revealed james henderson john chapman and james kirby all ex-british military now Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, has admitted that it was an IDF airstrike uh, on three different uh, vehicles in a convoy. One of those vehicles being marked clearly with the name of the charity they're working for, World Central Kitchen. World Central Kitchen have said, we notified the IDF of where we were operating. They'd been delivering aid. They just dropped off a huge amount of aid, food aid, and then they were traveling along a coastal road. Three different airstrikes, three different vehicles, Seven people killed in total. Now, um, Rishi Sunak has told Benjamin Netanyahu that he was appalled by mm. the killing. He has said he wants a thorough and transparent independent investigation. And that is what Benjamin Netanyahu and the IDF have promised to do. Um, what do you think... What do you think the response of the, of the international community has been? Do you, what do you think of it? Do you think it's correct people to be talking about being outraged, being appalled, demanding investigation? Or is this, well, something that terribly happens in wartime. It's a bit of everything. You know, it is something that terribly happens in wartime. Um, but you know, the outrage that's been shown against this particular aid convoy, you know, why wasn't there outrage against other NGOs that have been killed um, in the conflict that there is, both by um, uh, Israeli I mean, strikes more and by a, Hamas as More well. than 100 uh, aid workers, we understand, have been killed, largely uh, Palestinian. Yeah. Some of the concerns have been that actually some of these aid workers were actually working with Hamas, yeah. but, and, and, but and we don't know. We don't know. That's part yeah. of the problem. You know, 
undoubtedly this is a complete and utter muck up. Mm. Um, I would have used another word, but we're, but we're mm. on air and it's too early. Yeah. Um, uh, and the Israelis have stood up and admitted to that. Um, however, there are a few indicators in there that suggest to me that Israel needs to do some stuff about it. You know, they they need to tighten their targeting process. They had a very very good targeting process that would have stopped this sort of thing from happening. Um, uh, uh, or they've got a unit that has ignored the process and if that's happened they then need to get in identify that and, and discipline the individuals that are responsible but it also shows that they've got a, a higher appetite for collateral damage because you know i've heard the excuses this morning that intelligence had said that there were going to be hamas fighters in that convoy and we know hamas have used ambulances before yep. we know they've used vehicles marked up for the un before um we know that there are members of some of the ngos are members of hamas mm -hmm. as well but the question there is then were they were the aid workers who died were they collateral damage as in did they believe they were all hamas fighters and one of the reports coming out from uh, of the middle east is suggesting that they did believe there was a hamas fighter there yeah. so is that then an acceptable target because there's one hamas fighter or and, 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 the, and the aid workers are, are collateral damage, or is that still an unacceptable target in even in wartime because of the collateral damage? What would, for instance, the British Army or the US from, Army from, have from, done? From, from a British perspective, um, it would be unacceptable collateral damage. So the potential for a civilian to be in the vehicle, never mind an aid worker or anything else, would mean it would be a no-strike yeah. target. Okay. However, Israel has shown the whole way through that they've got a greater acceptance of collateral damage. And that's a political decision. You know, if they had believed that there was a high price Hamas individual in the vehicle, that would make it a, a legitimate mm. military target. You then have to go into the proportionality game. And as the proportionality of the yep. potential for collateral damage, civilians, aid workers or anything else, is that politically acceptable? Um, yeah. If you're targeting a military target, if you believe that there's a military individual in there, then under international law, it's a legitimate target. It is a legitimate target. It is a legitimate target. So you okay. can target hospitals, but, but there, you can it, target mosques. But there if you was believe. not, but there, they, they admitted there was not a fighter. So is it in communication? Well, look, I want to put out a social question on this, but I also want to, first of all, play you the official apology that we've had a statement from Ben Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, but we've also had a statement from the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces Chief of Staff, Herzi Halevi, apologizing for the killing of aid workers. It's a bit longer than this, but these are the crucial words that he had to say. Let's have a listen and a watch. I want to be very clear. The strike was not carried out with the intention of harming WCK aid workers. It was a mistake that followed a misidentification at night during a war in a very complex conditions. It shouldn't have happened. We will continue taking immediate actions to ensure that more is done to protect humanitarian aid workers. This incident was a grave mistake. Israel is at a war with Hamas, not with the people of Gaza. We are sorry for the unintentional harm to the members of WCK. We share in the grief of their families, as well as the entire World Central Kitchen organization from the bottom of our hearts. An independent body will investigate the incident thoroughly. We will complete it in the next coming days. Well, that was what the IDF chief of staff had to say. I, I, I mean, a full, a full apology, full acceptance of 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 what had gone wrong. This doesn't appear to be enough for the the international community. Certainly, so condemnation from pretty much across the board, including from uh, Joe Biden, of course, the most crucial ally, the U.S. president uh, for uh, the Israelis. There's talk of even um, demands for a military aid to be cut off. Now, we, I think the U.K. provides something like less than 0.2% you know, of uh, of Israeli military aid, um, but you know, and they they are a well-stocked country because they, they live in a war zone as well they as well we know um, but um, do you think that would be an appropriate response or do you think that actually a lot of the the talk from likes of Rishi Sunak um, I'm expecting a statement from David Cameron the Foreign Secretary very soon as well and the talk from the American President is kind of for domestic ears and is a concern about you know how this will look at, you know in the media to the general public but it's not necessarily representative of their real views, which will be an understanding that 
these things happen in wartime. Mistakes are made. British government, American government, every government will have done something similar in their past. I, I think there's a sea change here. You know, just because something's a legitimate military target, as was describing earlier, doesn't mean you have to hit it and doesn't mean yeah. that um, you, you, you're, you're not going to achieve things by, by, not, by not hitting it. Um, there's other things that you can do, like continue to surveil it. And I think what we've seen is a sea change in the international support, public support for Israel. And I think the statements that are coming out from Joe Biden, from um, Rishi Sunak and all the rest of it, are clear political statements mm. aimed at Israel, not aimed at just the domestic audiences. And they're saying to Israel, look, we recognise that you might not necessarily be following the targeting processes that we've been saying you're really, really good at. You might um, have too much of an acceptance of collateral damage. You know, just because there's a fighter in there doesn't mean that you have to hit it. Okay. Start to take a little bit more care um, because you know, our political support, given the pressures that are at home, you know, is, is very fragile. And again, we're in election years. Correct. This is very crucial yes, for an awful lot of governments. Um, now, the question I want to ask you, and I really do want to hear your thoughts on this, the Prime Minister here has demanded an investigation into the Israeli strike that killed three British aid workers in Gaza. I want to know, should the UK take a tougher approach to Israel? Should they? Yes or no? I'd love to know your reasons why. Do get in touch. Uh, please uh, give us a call on 0344 499 uh, You can text us on 87222 uh, and you can get in touch on X at Talk TV as well. Calls are charged at a national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. I mean, my view on this is very much like this is horrific. This is a terrible act uh, uh, that's happened in wartime. The fog of war is terrible. We tend not to get to the truth in the fog of war. The thing is, you know, we, we've got more truth about what's going on right now, have we not, than we would get from pretty much any other government and certainly from Hamas. Israel have come out and said, we've made a horrible mistake. This shouldn't have happened. We will investigate. They've admitted it. Now, that is very, very crucial to me. That makes a very, very big difference to what is actually going on. Um, but also, Christian, do people genuinely believe that Israel went, I know what, let's target seven foreign aid workers, let's kill them really blatantly. OK, it was not in broad daylight, it was at night time, they say. Let's do that. And um, no one will care in the international community. It won't put pressure on our allies. No one will be screaming at us for being, you know, murderous. That's fine. They're not that stupid. I mean, you, you, even the people who really, really actively dislike the Israelis and the Israeli Defence Force and think they're committing genocide, or whatever, do they really think they're all so stupid as well as, in their belief, murderous? That's my thing. It's a terrible, awful, tragic mistake. Do you want to know the sad thing? I think there are people who are that daft. Yeah, um, I know there are. They've been and, tweeting and, and, and me and the, this and the, and the trouble is they're being fed by this incessant um, anti-Israeli um, and um, genocide yeah. um, feeds through news feeds, and yeah. some of them legitimate news feeds, and through what people are picking up on social media. And of course, people only pick up on social media what they want to hear. So they've got they live in what, their echo chamber. What, what I call it's an echo chamber, a self misinforming. Oh well, I've been thing. asked at least five times this morning. You know, so who's you know, are you in the pay of the Israeli government? No, I think what they've done yeah. is awful. But. Yeah. I also accept that the British government will have done this. I'm not in the pay of that government either. Yeah, exactly. And every government in, in conflict. You know, we've got the Australian um, investigation into their, sp their special forces and extra uh, judicial killings in yep. Afghanistan. We've got that inquiry going on inside the UK with our special forces. Yep. You look at every conflict that there is, and there are blue on blue at different at, at different times. And that is, it's tragic. It should never happen. And the then, processes and, and, should yeah. stop it. But unfortunately, in war, it does. Now, this I think there's more to it. I think that, um, having read it all around it, I think that the Israeli unit that got involved um, thought that they knew better than the processes. The processes are there to stop or minimise this sort of thing. Yep. But I think they knew better than the processes and, and got into a bit of groupthink where they believed that there were terrorists in these vehicles yeah. and not... Uh, Here's the thing. I'm, I'm really looking forward to a full apology and investigation by Hamas all the civilians that they've killed. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not saying one equals the other because we expect more from a democratically elected government yeah. that is our ally in, in the Middle East. Um, I, of course I expect more from them than I do from Hamas. However, you know, I, I really do think it is extraordinary that you hold Hamas to such a low account everything they do, um, and then we hold uh, Israel to an account higher than we hold our own governments. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, all of these people that are criticising Israel the whole way through, I never see them, whether they're MPs, whether they are mm. um, 
members of the media, whether they're members of the public or anything else, um, even former military personnel, I never see them criticising Hamas as no. much as they criticise Israel. And there's one organisation started this, uh, I'm afraid, and it's, and it's Hamas. Yeah. Don't dilute that with all the historical issues that people then say, oh no, this started you know, back in the, when Israel was formed illegally. That's, I think you have to go that, back 2,000 years on some Twitter's reds, but there exactly. we are. Well, look, I do want to hear from you. Do please get in touch. Particularly want to hear from you on the phone, 0244 499 1000. If uh, you have a thought on this, whether you think that we should be taking sort of tougher, act, tougher action, have a tougher approach to Israel or not, love to hear your thoughts. You've heard what we've had to say. We're going to hear from lots more guests later in the show. Uh, want to hear your thoughts also, Philip Ingram, about J.K. Rowling. I have to say i mean i've, I've written a, a column in the sun today i described her as the boudica you know the the warrior Hallelujah. queen warrior queen <laughs> of, of the uh, of the turf movement a kind of proud trans exclusion radical feminist that's what that means but living on turf island look, we had this ridiculous new hate crime law that came into force on monday ironically April Fool's Day, um, and which made, made quite categorically didn't include women as a protected group in terms of what biological mm -hmm. sex, but did it include uh, trans people, which a government minister admitted. It, if someone said on Twitter or on any social media post or someone's face, a trans woman is a, is, a, is a man, not a woman, that could be regarded as offensive. Someone could say they were unhappy about it. Someone could be in Scotland unhappy about me saying it on air here um, in, in, in England and still be able to report me to Police Scotland Police Scotland could ask the Metropolitan Police to uh, have a quiet word. Now, I could either end up with a prosecution. You think, well, unlikely, except other people have been prosecuted mm -hmm. for the same thing. They've been able to overturn those prosecutions, but they have happened. Or I end up with a non-crime hate incident, but it sits on my record. And were I ever foolish enough to go and want to work with children, I would be banned from doing so. I might not even know I've got that non-crime mm -hmm. hate incident on my record. Now, um, Yesterday, Police Scotland, after J.K. Rowling basically said, come and arrest me, you know, she basically said, come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. Love her for this. Um, she, um, she was told by uh, Police Scotland uh, that, no, she would not be prosecuted. But she made the very, very good point that... Um, uh, she said, I hope every woman in Scotland who mm. wishes to speak up for the reality and importance of biological sex will be reassured by this announcement. And I trust that all women, irrespective of profile or financial means, will be treated equally under the law. She later tweeted to people that any woman who did face arrest you should get in touch um, and she would tweet the same thing or say the same thing. And then the police would be required to arrest her as well. They must treat everyone equally. Um, do you think this is going to be enough to sort of do away with this law? Or is it just the police trying to just extricate themselves from an embarrassing situation they've been put into yeah. and the SNP government, Labour and others who voted for this put them into? But actually, this law is still going to be in place and it will still have a chilling effect on free speech. Yeah, I, th I think you know, the police have been put in an invidious position, Police Scotland. Um, and actually, you're reading the reports in the newspapers, 3,000 people complained yesterday in one day. In one day. Well, you know, actually, if the police want to investigate a crime, there's 3,000 people who've just committed the crime of um, wasting police time. Because, yeah. the, because they're doing that. So let's, let's deal with them, prosecute them, and, and put that all yeah. over the front pages. That might stop people um, getting in. And, and I, I very much do think some of these people should be prosecuted. Yeah. But again, people say that I take an offence. You know, a trans woman is a man. You can take offence at that. And under the law, and, and actually even in England, people have been prosecuted mm -hmm. for this. It's, you know, I mean, Ofcom, Ofcom don't like me saying that. Yeah. Ofcom are very unhappy about yeah. it. Thankfully, but Maya Forstash of Sex Matters, um, you know, lost her job, went to a tribunal, appeals, won finally. Well, it's now a prote I hate the fact that it's called a protected belief but, but that, the, that, the, that the men cannot become women. It's actually a protected fact. Yeah, it, it is a protected fact. And and when it went through Parliament, you've been able you being allowed to describe someone who has transitioned, whether that's surgically uh, and every other way, um, into the, the what they want to be identified as as a, as a woman, yep. uh, but to describe them still as a biological ma uh, man is uh, was a specific piece in the Parliamentary Act that, that went through that uh, enabled all of this, and, yep. and therefore you can do that legally. So there's, there's again so much hype around this, mm. trying to make something of nothing and yep. trying to stir things up, and we the, the police need to stop the stirring. Absolutely. And that's coming from politicians but as again, much as anyone But again, we know else. that the, you know, the police college, they've been told in their training, you are not to continue recording non-crime hate 
incidents because because by definition it's not only you're sorting business what someone yeah. has said if they haven't committed yeah. a crime yeah. um and we're talking about you know someone saying something about someone else that someone else overhears yeah. or even is told about they don't even have to we overheard it and they can claim offense and they can uh, uh, uh what have you investigated and as one of our guests yesterday pointed out uh, helen joyce that actually this is one of the things that the process is the punishment it doesn't matter that yeah. you don't end up with a conviction at the end of it or your appeal works or even that there's just a there's no actual you know nothing happens after the police first turn up the process of you being questioned yeah. word goes around your local you know your street your if you live in a small village you might lose your job there might be question marks over you oh, what have you done what have you done the process is the punishment and they know that yeah, of course they do, and they're, and they're playing on it. You know, we need to get back in a society where PC actually stands for police constable and they're out in the communities <laughs> and doing proper policing oh, and keeping us safe way. from burglars and murderers and rapists and everything else. And, I mean, apparently, and apparently Scotland's got no proper crime. <laughs> Allegedly. No proper if, crime if, you've got if you've got time to deal with all of this, you know, any chief constable that allows his officers to go and deal with this sort of thing um, should not then be turning around and saying, I don't have enough yeah. money to carry out community policing. Also extraordinary how few people have ever been prosecuted uh, for the outrageous threats of violence against J.K. Rowling yeah. and her family. Yeah. Rape, yeah. mutilation, yeah. You know, death. Yeah. I mean, really foul stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, where, where are those cases? When have they come to court? Um, let's also talk about another story, which has got the, police, the government to a bit of a, uh, a load of hot water. Um, and this is... Um, uh, a bid to tackle homelessness, uh, let's get it right, uh, as part of the criminal justice bill. And with the threat of some 40 Conservative MPs who could actually um, uh, rebel on this, uh, trying to water down laws that effectively would, you know, criminalising homelessness, which, I mean, it's all, it is already uh, a criminal offence to be a rough sleeper, but um, this could actually see fines for rough sleepers of up to two and a half thousand pounds. Not sure if you can't afford a room for the night, you've got to spare two and a half grand yeah, exactly. um, or go to prison for a bad smell. I mean, excessive odour is, is is one of the things that could be used against people. Now, look, I don't I don't want anyone rough sleeping. Rough sleeping is a symptom of a problem, mm -hmm. is it not, with anything else? And whenever I see rough sleepers um, or people begging in my local area, I always talk to them and ask, you know, where are they from? I have to say, people who are foreigners, with all due respect, not my problem. You need to go. If you haven't got a job here, you need to go home. Sorry. Um, if you come here and you don't speak the language and then you can't, I mean, I just can't get a job. Shocker. You need to go home. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry. I don't want to, I don't want to have to deal with that. They should be deported immediately. Mm -hmm. However, people who are Britons often from people who've had mental health problems, mm -hmm. drug problems, children of abusive homes, ex-veterans, and you'll know many people uh, from the services who've struggled uh, back in Civvy Street. Um, those people need to be given help. And we know a lot of those people are scared of going into um, you know, homelessness shelters. Often there can be mm -hmm. violence in those shelters. They have lots of other problems. But the solution is not criminalising people, is it? No, no, not in the slightest. You know, I've, I've, got, I've got friends who you know, were senior Navy officers, highly qualified in what they did, um, and they say we're all just two steps away from being homeless. Um, and you know he had mental health issues. His marriage broke broke down, and he ended up um, uh, leaving the service and was homeless for yeah. over a year. And nobody did anything to help him at all. So we shouldn't criminalise homelessness in any way, shape, or form. And if we're bringing in you know bad smell, I, th I yeah. thought the National Farmers Union would have been up in arms because <laughs> of what goes on around the countryside or in the, all the meat processing factories. But the thing is, look, it, it is an issue. It's an issue around, say, cash points. And my local yeah. supermarket, I've often got people outside my local tube station in London, often have people, I mean, and, and frankly, on a very busy bit of payment, and there's a market stall as well, people selling papers. It, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a bit too much. And it is actually, I mean, I think for a lot of people, certainly for women, very intimidating yeah. uh, to have people, uh, you, know, uh, you know, come approach you, certainly outside a tube station, uh, outside a, a cash point. Um, I do think we need to deal with the issue. I don't think people should be allowed to sleep on the streets or to beg, but we need to come up with a more, uh, you know, treat, treat, you know, this isn't, you know, them being on the street isn't the problem. Yeah. The problem is why they're on the street. Ex exactly. We need to we need to come up with a plan to take people off the street, to give accommodation to those that genuinely need it, and deal with the organised crime gangs that are actually exploiting oh, yeah. um, the, the homelessness and, and are out begging in bits and pieces. You know, I've seen an individual get up from you know, begging on the street 
um, with his cup there and his dog and all, all the rest of it, walk around the corner, take his old smelly coat off and get into a very new uh, BMW and drive off. I, I, I have also followed various of the rough sleepers in my local area and yeah, the 100% they are... Well, they ain't rough sleepers yeah. or beggars, really. Exactly. It is organised And, and for, for, every, for everyone that does that, actually what they're doing is they're undermining the legitimate yeah. people who are genuinely rough sleeping, who are well, genuinely in hard times. But, but, but it's been very, very clear for many, many years, if you really want to help a rough sleeper, don't give them, don't give them, you know, a, a couple yeah. of quid or anything like that. Okay, yeah. People say, well, give them coffee or a, bit, or, 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 or a sandwich. Actually, no, what you should do is give money to a homelessness charity, an yeah. outreach group that will come and help those people. There, I mean, certainly my local council, you can call an outreach number. It's what I do and I get in touch with them or I email them and say look you know here's a photo this guy's been there for a couple of days can you please you know reach out and, and see if they can yeah. they, they can have some sort of help yeah. that is the right thing to do rather than assuaging your guilt like oh oh it makes me uncomfortable to walk past someone living on the street no do something practical and let yeah. the professionals uh, help I think that's much mm. better talking of professionals um, an awful lot of people um, have trouble with childcare in this country mm. the problem with childcare in this country is it's incredibly hard to get for a reasonable price many families I actually find certainly you know the dad usually goes back to work full time mum might want to work part time keep up her job but actually a lot of the time the, what a mum can bring home in wages after tax doesn't cover the full cost of childcare it's yeah. extraordinarily expensive uh, even if you've got you know just local good state childcare um, but uh, the government has been trying to deal with this and something that Labour brought in originally and Tories as well um, but uh, their, their plan uh, is for um, the uh, there to be basically free childcare 15 hours a week well, I'm not sure that covers most jobs you've got to get to them from a job you're basically covering a couple of hours a couple of days a week uh, for every child from the age of two to this month and they'll be extended to the working parents of children from the age of nine months in September but of course nurseries are saying we can't afford this we need by the end of next year 40,000 new staff mm -hmm. there is something going horribly wrong in this situation where it's costing a fortune for the parents the nurseries can't get the staff. The nursery staff are paid an absolute pittance. They're often on minimum mm -hmm. wage. Um, the system doesn't work, but it appears to be uniquely bad in Britain. Well, the system doesn't work. I'm, I'm not sure what happens in a lot of other countries. I don't think there's as many um, free childcare places, but I, you know, I could be wrong. So I, you know, mm. we'll, we'll, I'll probably set social media light by doing that. But I think the underlying principle is very sound. You know, we need to um, give as much free childcare to allow parents to get back to work and everything else. But there needs to be a plan in place as well that coordinates it, that brings in that additional capacity that um, childcare needs. And probably a lot of the capacity issues are down to the huge amounts of red tape that yep. they have to go through to be able to set this up. Yep. And rightly so the, for child the, protection, the, but... Well, no, we but, say rightly right, so, but, but other countries don't have it and they're not seeing a mass issue with children yeah. facing difficulties. I mean, you don't go through red tape for your grandmother to, you know, to look after your kid for a day. Yeah. And obviously, they need to be protections. Obviously, of course, yeah. they do. But I think ours are on the extreme. And the amount of paperwork, this the tick box of all oh, they did this today. I mean, I, my, yeah. my daughter was at nursery. I'm like, I, do, I don't want you writing anything up about yeah. what they yeah. what she's done. I just want to see. Take her away. I want to see what back. she's done, and also, <laughs> uh, yeah, and also, no, no. I just want, I want her to have had fun. I like that. I like arriving and she's covered in sand and glitter and probably someone else's snot as well as her own. <laughs> and I just have to, my view, I, I used to bring my daughter home from school, which is three, uh, from nursery school, and I used to put her in the bath and hose her down because God knows what was on her. <laughs> but she smiled from ear to ear because they'd had so much fun yeah, that my, day. my mother used to do that to me, I remember, <laughs> years ago. Before, she still does. Before there was regulation. She still does. <laughs> right, look, um, great to have you here, uh, Philip Ingram. Thank you very much. I want to hear from what our, our audience have to say as well. Asking you this morning about the Prime Minister demanding an investigation into the the Israeli airstrike that killed three British aid workers in Gaza among seven aid workers. I want to know, should the UK take a tougher approach to Israel? That is the question I am asking you. So you can get in touch on uh, 0344 499 uh, You can also send a text on 8722. Or you can get in touch on, uh, on X at Talk TV. I don't know how I'm going to get hold of uh, texts or tweets because no one seems to have brought any in to me. Uh, but we certainly have got a phone call. Tony is on the line in London. Hello, Tony. Good morning, Julia. Well, How are you? Very well indeed. A bit discombobulated about being back in the old studios. A bit disconcerting, but very nice indeed to hear from you, Tony. What do you want to say? 
Um, well, um, first, before I start, I've been watching you since you were 6.30 in the morning, oh, yes. talking to Julia hartley Brewer. I'm gushing. So <laughs> I, may not be, I may not be all that articulate. I do think you should be Empress of the Universe. Well, I mean, I, I agree with you on that last bit. <laughs> if only I was in charge. Can I just say, all the production team are looking in horror right now. <laughs> I they know nothing. <laughs> right, what um, do you want to say? Do you think we should take a tougher approach to Israel? I absolutely don't think we should take a tougher approach with Israel. I think we should take a tougher approach with Hamas, if we could. I know they're, they're a bunch of terrorists, but the war could be over today. All the, it's, it's a war between Israel and the government of the Gaza Strip. Hamas, all they have to do is give up. Yep. They invaded Israel. They murdered people. They, they, they murdered babies. They raped women. They're, they're, they're evil. Yep. And... If it, it's, it's ridiculous. It's like the Second World War. If the, if the Nazis had given up, we wouldn't have had to have bombed them. If yeah. It, if, well, this, this is the thing. Do you, think that, do, do you think people are holding Israel to two-hand account? Look, what they did here was yes, awful. It is ter it's a terrible, terrible tro loss of life. It shouldn't have happened. I mean, I think we can all accept that, can't we? But do you think the, the international outrage of this, the demands for an arms embargo, the demand for them to stop the war, do you think that is proportionate? No, absolutely not. Uh, absolutely not. They, uh, okay, there was a um, ceasefire, a, not a peace deal. There was peace and quiet before the 7th of October. And then Hamas got into Israel and simply murdered people, yeah. raped women. They were, they, they're, they're savages. I, it, yeah. There's no words to describe yeah. it. And the Israelis are fighting back. Hamas, the war could stop today. Why are we calling on ha why are we calling on Israel to stop? Why don't we call on Hamas to surrender, surrender your arms, surrender? And the Israelis will, excuse me, I, I don't know why I can say this. They could they bugger off again back to Israel. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you all the way. I, I think you can say that. You already did. Thank you very much, Tony in London. Really appreciate that. The time is 10.30. We're back in just a few moments. We're going to talk to a uh, Tory MP about, well, what Britain should do in our terms, our reaction uh, to uh, what Israel had to do. And we're going to be talking about that childcare issue as well. This is Talk TV. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you know>. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
the UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us. This is Talk TV with me, Julia Hollyburn. Still with me in the studio is Philip Ingram, former military intelligence officer. We've been talking about what's been going on in Gaza with, of course, that airstrike by the aid IDF on uh, the uh, seven aid workers, three of whom are British, who have died. We are told by the Israelis it was a mistake, uh, that uh, they believe there was, it was understood, uh, a, a Hamas fighter in that convoy. But there has been international outrage. I want to know, though, your reaction. Should there be international outrage? The Prime Minister here has demanded an investigation into that strike. Should the UK take a tougher approach? I'd love to hear from you. 0344 499 1000. You can send us a text on 87222 uh, or you can tweet us at or X us, whatever it is, at Talk TV. Love to hear still your Twitter. It's all Twitter. It is. It's, it's I say this Twitter. all the time, whatever they're called yeah. this week, but it's we all say Twitter, don't we? Absolutely. Well, look, let's uh, talk right now uh, to my next guest on this, and he is Bob Seeley. He's Conservative MP. He's a MP for the Isle of Wight, but he's also a member of the Foreign Affairs uh, Select Committee in the House of Commons. Uh, good morning to you, Bob. Good morning. Good morning, Julie. Thank good morning, you very Julie. much indeed for joining us. Um, what do you make of the, uh, first of all, the Israeli apology? We've had a very senior figure in the IDF. There's their chief of staff, Herzi Halevi, uh, issuing a very heartfelt, I believe, apology uh, for this event. Uh, we've had the Benjamin Netanyahu saying, you know, it was a mistake. Um, and then the demands from from uh, Joe Biden and for Rishi Sunak for an investigation. What do you make of uh, their reaction? OK, well, there's lots of bits there. Firstly, con uh, condolences to the families. Uh, they sound like impressive men and they had impressive military records. So I'm very sorry that they were killed. Um, clearly, the apologies are heartfelt from the Israeli side um, because clearly this was a mistake. Uh, and clearly this is very bad for the Israelis to have done this. However, um, this isn't the first time that aid workers have been killed in Gaza. Something like 170 aid workers have been killed. And when Palestinian aid workers are killed, it doesn't really make the media. And the problem is that Israeli targeting is much too willing to uh, accept a high civilian and high collateral damage rate. And I think as someone who is a, a great supporter of the state of Israel, I think this is doing Israel intense long term damage to its reputation throughout the world and its potential and its future. Well, this is the thing, isn't it, for me, is when people are saying, well, this is clearly a deliberate attack. They thought, you know, this is this is what the murderous, barbarous, genocidal um, Israeli regime does. I mean, this is all over social media, isn't it? Um, it, it seems this is a really stupid thing for Israel to have done in terms of their international PR. Now, none of that matters as much as the lives of those seven people who died. Um, we're particularly obviously concerned here in Britain about the, the three British workers, uh, eight incredibly brave men who worked in the British military, now going out and doing incredibly important work, saving lives uh, in Gaza. And we absolutely salute those people. As you say, our hearts go out to them and their, their families. But it would be an, an absurd thing for Israel to think, yeah, we're just going to target these guys and um, we're going to kill aid workers, foreign aid workers, um, and, and, and we reckon we're going to get away with it. They clearly didn't think they were just aid workers. That would be rather obvious, wouldn't it? In which case, um, they must have believed that there was a Hamas fighter or something. But how does that happen? I mean, we know there's the fog of war, but how does that happen when you're in a situation where they say, look, it was at night, um, they believe they had, you know, they believe it's thought that there was a Hamas fighter with them. Even if that were the case, would that be a legitimate target, given the awful phrase, the collateral damage of those other people in that convoy? OK, legitimate target, it depends on how important the target is and how many how much collateral damage you're willing to endure. If this was a, a run-of-the-mill Hamas fighter, this would not be um, this would not be acceptable. Um, if this was a senior commander, Israel's own rules of war might say it is. Um, and that explains why 
uh, Israel will level a, a, a block of flats, killing 10 or 20 uh, Palestinians potentially in order to hit a tunnel with a senior Hamas commander beneath it. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying that is the thought process that you go through. So it depends how much collateral damage, how many civilian casualties you're willing to endure is, is, is somewhat dependent on the value of the target and whether you can defend that in a court of law afterwards. I, I, I have no doubt there were processes that Israel has gone through. The problem is has become as has become very very evident and forget about the the anti-semites and the anti-israeli idiots on twitter let's just you know have a have a serious and sensible conversation is that israel is quite clearly it's so determined to deal with hamas uh, that its proportionality which is an important part of the principles of humanity in international humanitarian law the rules of law geneva conventions hague conventions all those sorts of good things um, those rules are simply being uh, bent out of shape by Israel because it is willing to endure very high civilian casualties, proportionality, as in its attempt to get rid of Hamas. And frankly, it is doing itself increasing amounts of damage uh, to to achieve that. Well, indeed, and there are lots of concerns about you know the the, the plan to go into Fatah. Uh, uh, sort of fatter, I'm saying. Sorry, Rafa, um, yeah. uh, and uh, and 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 the risk of civilian loss of life then as well, and the massive concerns about the the basic state of malnutrition and potential starvation of of civilians in uh, in in Gaza. Do you think the international community, including our own government, are we doing enough to make sure of that? Look, you know, we can be very supportive of Israel's right not just to self defence, but to go in and take out Hamas. And yes, accepting that there will be. The collateral damage of civilian deaths, there will be. It happens in all wars. There's never been a war where that's not happened, including those uh, that have been pursued by, by our country. But are we doing enough in the West to make sure that Israel stays on the right side of the line on that to protect the needs of civilians, in particular getting aid into the, to the people of Gaza? I think the US has been surprisingly robust, actually. Uh, and I think the UK has been pretty robust as well. Whether Netanyahu's government wants to listen is another matter. And the problem is, I don't think Netanyahu's government is listening. Uh, and I think there are some probably some very unhealthy internal Israeli political dynamics here. Mm. Which means that the longer that Netanyahu can, um, uh, can extend the crisis, potentially that is the best way for him to survive politically. So I think there is, you're now seeing a lot of opposition to the Netanyahu government again in Israel, um, and this clearly is not going to help them. Um, there's some talk about should we be cutting off intelligence sharing? This is absolute nonsense. We're not intelligence sharing with Israel because it's a signal that we think they're nice or not. We're intelligence sharing with Israel in the same way that we do with the Saudis because it is in our national interest to do so because these people, Israel is has an incredible intelligence network throughout the Middle East and especially in Syria. And if we start sulking or tut-tutting and cutting off our intelligence sharing relationship, when we want Israel to help us stop a terrorist attack in this country that's maybe originating out of Syria, if they turn around and say, well, you've cut off your intelligence sharing with us, that, that damages our national security. So I think we have to have a sense of reality here that we gain a lot out of the intelligence sharing that we have not only with Israel, but with other governments that we sometimes disagree with, like the Saudis, yeah. that is different from what Israel is doing. And Israel's friends should be telling Israel bluntly, you're damaging yourselves. Prosecute your war against Hamas, but don't kill civilians or do more to stop civilians being killed. And as I say, this 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 has reached the papers only because and the and the media only because there are seven Westerners killed. Yeah. There have been nearly two hundred Palestinians killed. Yeah. Um, just aid workers alone. Yeah, absolutely. And that is a very, very crucial point. Um, I just want to ask you finally, though, we've had this apology from the Israeli government and the IDF. Um, have we had an apology yet from Hamas for all of the uh, civilians they've killed? No, no. You, look, you make a very good point, but the answer to that is a simple one, Julia. Israel does not consider itself to be on a moral level with Hamas, and Israel is not our Hamas in the Middle East. Israel is a law-governed state and sets itself much higher standards. We know that Hamas has no standards, um, has no moral standards, and will slaughter and rape and mutilate uh, Israelis where they can. That is not the point. It is not a law-governed state when Israel is, yeah. and Israel, if Israel says it lives by a higher set of standards, it needs to meet those higher set of standards because that is what it is saying about itself.
OK, thank you very much indeed. That's Bob Seeley, Conservative MP, member of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Um, let's bring Philip Ingram back in. Um, I mean, this is the thing. Mm. It's, it's a fair point, isn't it? It's like, oh, outrageous this has happened. You know, Israel, admit it, apologise, um, um, say they will investigate. Um, yeah, OK, an independent investigation would be the correct thing, absolutely. But... When, when Hamas makes their false claims about, you know, oh, the IDF have bombed this particular hospital, and like, no, it turns out it was actually one of their uh, their terrorist bombs that uh, that hit the hospital, and they claim 400 have died, when actually it's nothing like that. And never get an apology for that. Mm. Never get an invent investigation for that. We are holding. We, we always do. We we hold completely different standards to, to these, these different sides of this war. We do, we do. The, the key thing that Bob said in there was the phrase proportionality. Uh, and people have this belief that under international law there is a, you know, a proportionality line. Yeah. One side of it you're legal, the other side of it you're not. There isn't. There are multiple lines. Those proportionality lines are dictated by the government that is controlling the operation. In this case, it's the Israeli government. That's a different proportionality line to the UK one, to the US one, to the French, to uh, anyone else's. Um, and that's where what the Israelis need to be able to do is justify what they're doing from a military perspective in international court. Look at the, the, the big proportionality bit where during the Second World War the US used two nuclear weapons to destroy two cities mm. because they knew that uh, in proportional terms that would sh that would shorten the Second World War yes. significantly save and lives save overall. lives yep. overall. But they have to justify that. But the yep. arguments at the time, if we had the same people out there on Twitter um, commenting, would have been you know, ranting and raving against the United oh, States. Oh, and some, uh, and some are already. Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, look, let's uh, get your thoughts on all of this as well as the Prime Minister demanded an investigation into the Israeli strike that killed three British aid workers in Gaza. Should the UK take a tougher approach is my question. You can call us on 0344 Four double nine one thousand. I've just learnt you can WhatsApp us on that as well. That same number oh three double four four double nine one thousand. You can text the word talk to eight seven treble two, uh, or you can uh, tweet us at talk TV. Um, some of those messages coming in. Terry says he needs to concentrate on the problems we have here in the UK. A lot of people think that. Uh, Mel says uh, Rishi Sunak should demand an investigation into the potholes covering Britain's roads. Clary says Israel is doing the right thing. They're protecting themselves against the Hamas terrorists. Uh, Jazz says Israel condemns killing of aid workers. It seems no matter how hard Israel tries to avoid this situation, it is not going to go away and we will see this sort of thing happening again and again. Andrew says he should keep his nose out of everyone else's business except for the people who pay his wages. These public servants have gotten way too big for their boots. Uh, let's go uh, to the phone lines now. Jenny is on the line. She is in New, new Key in Wales. Hello. I didn't know there was a New Key in Wales. Yes, there's a new key, but it's a uh, new key. Space. Not not new key. <laughs> right, got that. No. Jenny, thank you so much for calling in. So what do you think? Do you, do you think the UK should take a tougher approach to Israel or not? No, I don't. Uh, and I'm very glad Philip Bingham's with you because he might be able to verify this. Mm -hmm. um, suppose false intelligence comes from Hamas to say that there is a Hamas fighter in something or other that's aid... Yeah or, you know, ambulance or whatever. Um, and it's false. So therefore, the Israelis legitimately bomb it, yeah. um, as you have said already. Um, then that would mean there would be such an outcry that uh, Hamas fighters could then use anything for aid with impunity. Would Very good point. Be a point. Philip, what do you make of that? Oh, distinctly possible. You know, the, we know Hamas have used disinformation across across the board trying to um, set Israel up and trying to change the um, and influence the commentary that's going on in the international community so that you, your intelligence processes should be robust enough to be able to filter that out. Mm -hmm. But, in the, heat but. Of, in, the, in the heat of war, in the speed of what's going on, and if you've got people who are not necessarily following the procedures... But you were as saying much processes, they, do, they might be ignoring the, what the, what the uh, senior it, it, commanders it, it, are saying. It, exactly. But that's an interesting thing, so Jenny, it isn't it? It's a, you know, we, we, we get these sort of false flag operations. But, but Hamas win either way. Either, you know, like when they hide behind civilian targets, they've used ambulances before and aid workers' uh, uh, vehicles before. And, of course, they get in hospitals and, and schools and the like. If, they, if they, that protects them from attack, they win. And if they still get attacked... Israel gets blamed for it and they win again. Can I just say something further? Mm, and I don't do. think it seems to be something understood by anybody. Um, I'm a, not only a theologian, but I also have studied um, the Quran and the Hadith. Mm -hmm. now, and I can tell you this, that our idea of peace in the West 
is not the Muslim idea of peace. So when you're talking about peace, you're actually talking at cross purposes. Douglas Murray would be able to verify this. Doug, yeah, Douglas Murray has talked about this a lot, hasn't he? Listen, thank you very much, Jenny. I so appreciate your call. Thank you for getting in touch. Do get in touch again. Uh, the time now is coming up to 10.48. and going to have to race it to a break. We're back with you in just a few moments. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, it's here. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to <laughs> yeah. for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. And, uh, good morning. Welcome back. Uh, this is a Talk TV with me, Julia Hartley Brewer. If you're just tuning in, well, yes, we are in a different studio. Uh, uh, all will be explained a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, we are in a different studio today. I'm delighted to say Philip Ingram is still with me, a former military intelligence officer. Um, I don't know have you, how, how many kids have you got. Did you have kids in nursery and things when you, you, you had when they were younger? Oh yes, but I was overseas and everything else. So, 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 They're so, all so, so very different. different. I remember my time in nursery. Very, 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 very different from now when parents uh, basically uh, scrabbling to get a place exactly. at, uh, at any sort of nursery and scrabbling to get the cash together to pay for it. Well, no wonder so many parents, I know parents on some very high incomes who are delighted to find out people are over 100, well, up to 100K uh, uh, each, not even just as a jo as joint income, uh, basically being thrilled uh, getting uh, months and months, uh, well, free childcare. Uh, you're going to get up to 15 hours of free childcare for any child aged over two uh, as of uh, uh, this autumn and then it's going to go to children uh, from nine months plus. Trouble is can they actually find the nursery staff and the nursery places? Well uh, let's talk to my next guest on this as Georgina Fuller who is a parenting journalist. Good morning to you Georgina. 
Good morning, Julia. Thank you for joining us. Well, some of the night childcare nursery providers are saying by the end of next year, they're going to need an extra 40,000 workers in their nurseries to, to actually provide all these places because there are strict laws, aren't there, about you know how many workers you have per child of different ages. But the government announcing this rollout, all paid for by taxpayers, great, lovely for the parents, but can parents actually find enough places for their children? Well, I mean, there's, there's a huge problem with staffing and, you know, childcare in general is massively undervalued, I think, and it's essential to the kind of basic economy uh, and infrastructure for anybody that works. Yeah. So um, they need to be recruiting more and training. Why, why um, can't they recruit people? Is it because it's too low paid? Is it people don't want to do the job? I would have thought it's very rewarding work for people. I mean, it's largely young women doing this work. Very rewarding work. But my understanding is, you know, parents are paying a fortune. Care worker, the nursery care workers are earning a pittance. Someone's making money out of this or are they? Yeah, I think, I mean, there was an article last week about a childcare worker that had had to give up uh, working in the nursery because she couldn't afford, it, it was something like 60 Oh, this is, I'm so sorry, Georgina, your um, line is going funny. Um, I, don't, I hope we can persevere with it. Yes, they're saying, look, they can't afford to do the job. So is the answer that people are paid more, but then that will push the cost of childcare up even more? Oh, we've lost the line already. We're not doing very well. <laughs> Georgina, if you can hear us, apologies, but we I don't think we can persevere because the line has gone. Well, we're a few more floors up, so maybe the, the difference between maybe, the studios maybe that's is what it, that maybe that, It's all on a technicality, <laughs> Philip. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. But this, I, I just remember when I, when I had a little one and, and we, we were told we, we'd get, you know, 10 hours of free childcare mm. or something. It wasn't free because they basically, the local council only provided by the government £2.50's worth of childcare an hour. You can't get child care for £2.50. And she's yeah. only 17 now. But trust me, it, you ain't, there's no child care available uh, at that price. So they don't even cover the full cost. So what we've been hearing from these child care uh, providers is that they're having to put the prices up of, you know, you might get your 15 hours, but then all the other hours you get, and that's basically two days of going to work, you're going to have to pay even more. So you kind of give with one hand and take away with the other. Is the answer not for the government to subsidise this stuff, but to just make sure this stuff is affordable? Well, yes, make it affordable, but I think in some cases it needs to be subsidised. And we have to question why people on, you know, six-figure salaries you know, are jumping in joy at getting additional free childcare because they tend to live in areas where there are plenty of places. You know, there, needs, there, there needs to be a way of getting more money into those areas where the, you, the, the people need to get out to work and, and you know, that's subsidised in a greater way. A lot of this comes down to local councils as yeah. well. Um, and local council budgets are, are stretched in such a way um, that providing wider care in the community is, is difficult. But I think there also needs to be a degree of flexibility with employers because my stepdaughter's got a little one that's mm. in, in childcare. She keeps going for permanent jobs in the NHS. She's a nurse. Um, and she can't get them because they will show no flexibility in the hours that she um, is available to work when she's got her little one in childcare. Yeah. That's not beyond the realms of getting things sorted out to make it easier for people who have got childcare places to get back into work and be able to contribute um, uh, elsewhere. So she does her bank work, which allows her that sort of flexibility. But it's it's then not giving that permanent job into the NHS, and it's bad statistics for the government, um, and um, you're bad for the wards and everything else. So I think there's there's a multiple issues need to be dealt with, and they're not all to be dealt with at ministerial level. A lot of these are to be dealt with actually at local level. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Well, we shall wait and see what happens, and parents will be getting in touch. But it ain't working. Uh, coming up, we're going to get to the news uh, right now. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna, 
and yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, it's here. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> a, <laughs> yeah. minute, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unbiased and fiery debate? Then join us for Cross Talk. One o'clock every weekday. Uh, good morning to you. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. This is Talk. We're on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker, of course. Now, coming up in the next hour, Rishi Sunak has demanded answers from Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu after an Israeli airstrike killed seven aid workers, including three British citizens. The head of Israel's army has apologised for what he called a grave mistake and promised full investigation of the incident. We'll talk more about that. Plus, a record 5,000 channel migrants have already arrived in the UK so far this year. That's up 30% on the same period last year. Well, we found that out the other day. Now we found out the reason why. The government's blamed it on the weather. And the Labour Party have said that Tory mismanagement of the economy has hammered economic growth with a net loss of 40,000 businesses. But would Labour do any better? All that uh, coming up after the latest news headlines with Holly Hudson. Talk TV News at 11. Good morning. The three British aid workers who've been killed in Gaza are being remembered as heroes by the charity they worked for. John Chapman, James Henderson and James Kirby were among seven volunteers for the World Central Kitchen in an airstrike Israel said was unintended. Former NATO commander Chris Parry told Talk Today it's contemptible incompetence by the Israel military. But what I suspect has happened is an intelligence failure. Uh, I think there was a confusion earlier on that an aid truck that had been accompanying the convoy uh, had a Hamas gunman uh, with it. Uh, and I'm afraid to say the intelligence trail led to uh, the attack afterwards. Well, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says he's appalled by the deaths and has summoned the Israeli ambassador for the first time in 12 years. And United Nations officials say they're gravely concerned by the situation. This incident is yet a further reminder that Israel needs to do much more to protect humanitarian personnel and facilities in Gaza. We join other countries who lost citizens in this incident in calling for a transparent and comprehensive investigation. 
This must Dozens not happen again. Dozens of people again. remain trapped as a huge rescue operation continues after Taiwan's powerful earthquake. Seven people are now known to have died and more than 700 people injured after the island was struck by the 7.4 magnitude quake, causing buildings to collapse and triggering tsunami warnings. A schizophrenic man who stabbed his neighbour to death 20 years ago has escaped from a mental health facility in East London. Police say Philip Theot Theophilu, who's 54, should not be approached. They say they're concerned he has no access to medication and the risk he could pose without it. An ad by Katie Price for a low-calorie diet has been banned. The advertising watchdog ruled her post for the skinny food company was irresponsible and must not appear again. The former glamour model was promoting eating meals containing calories around a third of the NHS's recommended daily intake. And we're quite used to seeing our royals on social media, but in Japan, it's a different story. Well, for the first time, its royal family has launched an Instagram account in a bid to appeal to youth. The world's oldest monarchy is hoping to shake off its image of being reclusive and out of touch. It had more than 320,000 followers by the end of its first day. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Isabel Lang. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. It really is a very unsettled picture with low pressure systems queuing up to bring spells of wind and rain. They look really quite nasty as we head into Friday and the weekend. Even today we've got low pressure circulating across central areas. That's where the most persistent wet weather will be. It does sound a bit brighter to the south with showers, but under that rain across more northern areas of England, southern Scotland, only around 7 degrees with an onshore wind. Really quite unpleasant, tricky travelling conditions as well, with the rain only slowly easing as we head through tonight. Now in the south, after a brief respite, we see more rain coming in. Bands of heavier rain working from west to east, quite gusty winds as well. And it could well be that we encounter some quite heavy downpours at times, particularly as we head through the early hours of the morning across the southwest. And those will run along coastal counties. So the southeast could well be quite wet tomorrow morning. Still a contrast in temperature, chilly in the north, mild across most parts. And then tomorrow we get rid of the heavy showers across the southeast first thing in the morning. And then it will turn a bit brighter, but still further scatter showers likely. Central areas look rather cloudy and dull and damp. Northern areas a little drier, thankfully, than today with a bit of brightness across northwest Scotland. Chilly in the north, mildish in the south. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartleybrew. This is Talk. We're on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Great to have your company. If you're just tuning in, we are in a different studio. We're actually back in the old radio studio. Uh, rather, TV studio is being used for something else rather important. But uh, we will be revealed a little bit later. Uh, right now, I'm delighted to be joined in the studio by Philip Ingram, former military intelligence officer. Good morning once Good again morning. to you. Uh, and obviously, the biggest story of the day is what we're asking our social question about. And uh, that, of course, uh, is that... Uh, a horrific attack on aid workers in Gaza, killing seven foreign aid workers. As many people are pointing out, um, up to 200 or so um, aid workers who are not foreign work, not for Pal Palestinians, have also already been killed mm -hmm. in that uh, in the Gaza war. Um, uh, but of course, when it's foreign aid workers, get more attention. Three British aid workers uh, are included among those. Uh, they have been named as James Henderson, John Chapman, and James Kirby, all ex-military, all working mm -hmm. uh, with this charity, World Central Kitchen, an American-based aid agency providing uh, food and other the vital aid to people in Gaza. Incredibly brave men uh, doing, and uh, women also involved in those deaths um, doing incredibly important work. Now, the Prime Minister here in the UK, Rishi Sunak, has done an investigation into the Israeli airstrike that killed those aid workers. And I want to know, should the UK take a tougher approach to Israel? You can get in touch uh, on the phones. You can call us on 0344 499 1000. You can also WhatsApp us on that number. You can text 8722. You can also get in touch on X at Talk TV. I'd love to hear your thoughts, particularly uh, your messages on the, well, get in touch on the phones. Just before I, I, I talk a little bit more about this, I just want to read you a quote from David Cameron. Uh, he has just arrived at a NATO meeting in Brussels. And in the last few minutes, the Foreign Secretary uh, has described the killing of the aid workers as dreadful. Uh, he said, we should mourn the loss of 
of these brave humanitarian workers. Uh, he also said the dreadful events of the last two days are a moment when we should mourn the loss of these brave humanitarian workers, including the three British citizens that tragically were killed. We should also send our condolences to their families and our thoughts should be with them. He also was speaking about events in Ukraine, which is what this uh, uh, METO meeting is supposed to be ostensibly about, but no doubt they'll be talking about Gaza as well. Philip Ingram, you know, you're an ex-military man. You've been there in the fog of war. I'm an armchair general. I talk a good game, but I am, you know, far too cowardly. Yes, ma'am. To actually, you know, to actually go and, uh, you know, uh, you know, pick up. I mean, I, I defend my own country, but I'm not. I'm not as brave as you, as you brave souls. All these, these seven incredible brave souls who've been out in, in Gaza. Um, should. Should the, uh, the, the, the British government, should we take a tougher approach to Israel? Should, should we be condemning Israel for this event? Well, it's, it's a very difficult question to answer. I think what the UK and the US are doing is behind closed doors holding Israel more to account and ensuring that they're following the processes that they have in place, that the proportionality stakes that Israel are applying um, become uh, more um, open to uh, the, the UK and US's view as to why they're trying to achieve these sorts of things and forcing Israel to justify what they're doing. You know, it's absolutely shocking what's happened overnight. It's absolutely shocking that any civilian loses their life um, in conflict, but unfortunately it's something that happens um, in war. Israel has stood up very quickly and admitted this. Um, but then they're being held to account by the UK, US and all the rest of it. Mm. And they understand the implications that that's going to have on potential international support. And therefore, cynically, they could be doing this just because they want to maintain that international support. But it's, it's really important. I mean, countries that, act cynically all the time. Well, they do. They do but you could it's, argue that the condemnation from many Western nations whose own forces would have done very similar yep. things is also cynical because, you know, everyone's... Look, here's the thing. Everyone has to pretend to the people on social media, the general public, none of whom, you know, most of whom, including me, don't go to war and don't know the realities of war, that, that, that we're all shocked and surprised that innocent people die in war. I'm sorry, I'm a bit more hard-headed than that. I've covered a lot of wars yeah. uh, as, as a journalist, again, as an armchair general journalist. Um, and, and, and the awful tragedy is that the reason why war is terrible is that civilians die. They died in all wars, even in very moral wars. Our fight against the Nazis. You know, millions of people yeah. died, civilians yeah. died as a result of that war. And, and, and when you've got countries that have been inflicted the pain that Israel was on the 7th of October, and you've got their war against Hamas has been going on now for six months, um, sometimes it becomes difficult to see the bigger picture. And this is where you need a conscience. And the conscience here is coming from the UK and the US. Um, in the public statements that have come out from Rishi Sunak and from the US administration turning around saying, we want you to investigate this. So it's, it's, it's whispering in their ears publicly, hey, mm. come on, this is unacceptable. And actually, we're probably detecting that other things you're doing are, are not yeah. following the rules that we expect you to well, follow. Indeed. And, and from what, for reports coming out of the Middle East, again, it's just, you know, they, they didn't accidentally, just there was a, wasn't a bomb that went off mm. and these three vehicles uh, from the... Uh, the charity uh, World Central Kitchen happened to be involved. No, there were three targeted missile yep. attacks. They deliberately wanted to target these vehicles. Uh, why? Did they think they were all uh, full of volunteers uh, with this uh, uh, food aid agency? Uh, the un our understanding is, from other reports in the Middle East, that they believe there was at least one Hamas fighter mm -hmm. in there. Now, would it justify an attack on those three vehicles, knowing, I mean, you, know, you know there are at least three people at that point, would it justify an attack on those vehicles if you thought there was one Hamas fighter and it's okay to take out those three vehicles? You know, bare minimum, you're looking at uh, two uh, civilian casualties then, and as we know, far more. Um, the, the charity has said, look, we told the IDF, we know this is there's lots of communication. We told them we're going in. They delivered the food aid. They were leaving again along the coastal road. They gave them their route. They were not hiding. You know, uh, they, they were being very, very clear because that's how they keep safe. If it's a low level fighter, you know, an, indiv an individual foot soldier in Hamas, no. If it's a senior commander who's influencing everything that's going on, it could be. Um, and that's where, without that sort of information, we don't know. But part of the problem is we've seen Hamas using aid convoys, ambulances, and other things to transport military goods around um, uh, whenever things are going on, even whenever their parent organizations have turned around and said, we're going to be operating in this area. So Israel is operating in an area where there's an awful lot of confusion, there's an awful lot of disinformation. 
that is trying to throw is really targeting off and then this information has, has come in now how yeah. they've handled it how they've processed it I don't think they've done it in as much of a, a, a way that you'd diligently expect them to do and that's where this mistake has happened yeah. but it but it's it's a mistake uh, yeah indeed well look let's have a watch and a listen uh, of the IDF's chief of staff his most senior figure in the Israeli Defence Forces uh, Herzi Halevi uh, he issued a statement uh, overnight apologizing for the killing of those aid workers in Gaza. It's slightly longer than this clip, but these are the crucial words that he had to say. We can't seem to get it. That's a shame. Well, I mean, well, well what he did have to say, we know, was, you know, very, very clear that, that there was, it was a full apology, that they accepted what they had done, uh, you know, that, that it was wrong and... it. Very different from anything we've ever heard from Hamas. It, well, we, we've heard nothing from Hamas, and actually, the speed of the Israeli response here and their admission of, of uh, that they they carried out this attack has been quicker than I've seen before as well. Now, that could be two things: one, they um, are genuinely remorseful and recognise they've genuinely made a mistake, um, and, and the cynic in me says, and that's probably slightly because we've got the US administration and we've got the UK and other countries yeah. coming in and, and publicly condemning Israel but for they, it. But they would have known that was going to happen. I mean, that's the crucial thing here because everything, all the criticism of Israel, oh, they did it deliberately, um, you know, and, and they knew they, they were just they, aid workers. That That is predicated on the belief that, that this is a genocidal, murderous yeah. regime yeah. that cares not to hoots yeah. for innocent life. Um, everyone is expendable and, you know, and they don't care what the international world, the, the, you know, community thinks. There is no evidence for any of those statements. There, there's not, and that only exists in you know, a Twitter echo chamber or yeah. other social media echo chambers, which unfortunately is fuelled by some commentary that's coming from uh, some mainstream press outlets. Um, but it's also being fuelled by um, the likes of Hamas, because their information operation is very good, Iran, who's pushing it out through different countries, Russia, who's pushing it out through different countries, and we're being influenced in so many different ways. And that doesn't yeah. mean it's coming in Iranian or Russian. It, it, it's translated into the, the way it's being fed to us. Yeah, indeed. Um, I think we have now got that apology clip uh, from the IDF's chief of staff. Let's have a listen and a watch to what he had to say. I want to be very clear. The strike was not carried out with the intention of harming WCK aid workers. It was a mistake that followed a misidentification at night during a war in a very complex conditions. It shouldn't have happened. We will continue taking immediate actions to ensure that more is done to protect humanitarian aid workers. This incident was a grave mistake. Israel is at a war with Hamas, not with the people of Gaza. We are sorry for the unintentional harm to the members of WCK. We share in the grief of their families as well as the entire World Central Kitchen organization from the bottom of our hearts. An independent body will investigate the incident thoroughly. We will complete it in the next coming days. Well, uh, that's what the Israeli De uh, Defence Forces chief had to say. We're going to be talking about this with an Israeli government spokesman, uh, uh, Avi Hyman, uh, very, very soon. So we'll, we'll see what he uh, has to say. Um, let's, uh, uh, let's also now move on and talk about J.K. Rowling. Um, she apparently will not be prosecuted for making the statement that uh, trans women are not women. They are men on uh, social media, even though the new hate crime law in Scotland came into force on Monday, on the day she tweeted, April Fool's Day, rather ironically, um, uh, which which effectively says if someone is offended by such a statement and trans uh, trans people are a that's a protected characteristic, um, um, then you know they, they could be prosecuted, either prosecuted and facing up to I mean you know seven years by boss. I mean it's really quite extraordinary, um, or um, uh, they could uh, uh, they could end up with a non crime hate incident uh, record on their name. Uh, she's been told that uh, according to the police uh, that uh, she will not be facing any charges or any investigation as a result of her tweets on Monday, quite rightly. But she responded by saying, I hope every woman in Scotland who wishes to speak up for the reality and importance of biological sex will be reassured by this announcement. And I trust that all women, irrespective of profile or financial means, will be treated equally under the law. Do you think that women, not just in Scotland, but across the UK will now be protected? Because by the way, I could be, I could be facing arrest uh, as a result of this because if someone in Scotland, here's what I have to say, 
trans women are not women. I mean, no disrespect. I'm just stating a fact. I could be a, I could be questioned by the police for that. Do you think this is going to provide for protection, or is this just Police Scotland desperately trying to avoid some terrible publicity? Well, I think Police Scotland have been put in an impossible position, and and in an impossible position where it's not clear for them how to interpret the law, you know, they're 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 not going to come and jump up and down. If they if they wanted to do anything, and I think as I said earlier, there's three thousand people put complaints in yesterday. Yeah. They're wasting three thousand guys. They're, they're, three thousand in 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 a, in a day. They're wasting police time yeah. for something that is not an issue. It's the intent behind yeah. it. If you intend to harm someone by if calling not, them names, but that, then this is that's my a, thing. You don't need crime. a new law. So if you're being abusive, yeah. you're threatening people. They citing exist violence against people. Those yeah. laws already exist. I don't think it matters whether someone's doing it because, you know, attacking me because of my, the colour of my skin or my gender or anything like that. I don't think it's relevant. If you are being abusive, if you are threatening uh, somebody, then, then that should be a well, criminal yeah, offence. The, the, I think the, it's irrelevant what it's about. The, the, the military are going to be in huge trouble because all the Scots are jocks, all the, yeah. all the Welsh are taffs and all the, Irish, all the Irish are paddies. Don't so, get me in trouble. So. <laughs> don't get me in trouble. It depends. It's how but it, you but say it. But it's how you it, say it. And, it? and all of that's meant in, you know, the, the, in the the Kenny Everett way, the best possible taste. Yeah, exactly. I'll not do the bit with the legs. And there's a way, for instance, where, like, you know, I, mean, I wouldn't think it was against the law, but where a man could say, uh, call a woman, you know, darling or sweetheart in a derogatory way, in a way, so I talk to people all the time. You know, it's actually a really fond way in a very yeah. warm way. Exactly. Yeah. But this is where the nuance of, yeah. of human interaction has been sort of thrown out, out the window, hasn't it? It's, it's, it's very frustrating. Yeah. That's it. The thing I don't understand when people say, like you, oh, the police, you know, they've been given this difficult task. We're constantly told by governments that well you know it's an operational matter the police get to decide their priorities that's what we had to elect police and crime commissioners so they would try and like berate the police and make sure they went along with the priorities we have our priorities are you know violent crime rape murder uh, burglaries you know thefts of mobile phones and muggings and all that but but they don't prioritize a lot of that stuff mm. so when police are investigating somebody for a hurty tweet um, uh, but not investigating every single burglary. Yeah. They are choosing those priorities. I feel sorry yeah. for the the you know the walk, Bobby on the beat who's forced to do that. But when they choose like not to, although they did eventually arrest a guy who held a swastika placard up at the uh, pro-Palestinian march on on the weekend in London, you know, where, oh, it's all in the context. You know, they pick and choose themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry, it's the police who, who got this on their back, as far as I'm concerned. But but again, the pressure will come on the chief constable through the police and crime commissioners. Mm -hmm. The police and crime commissioners are politically motivated in what they're doing. The the chief constables will be um, you know, mandated to to say that they have dealt with. You know, hate crime or yeah. with other with other offensive issues uh, and what percentage of activity that'll be a, a KPI for them. You know, yeah. I think we need to get in policing PC back to police constables on the beat in communities, not dealing with all of this PC um, uh, yeah, just garbage deal, deal with, that's deal going with crime. around. Yeah, that's that's going around in social media. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's also talk about um, uh, the government facing a revolt from up to 40 Conservative MPs. That would wipe out their majority <laughs> at the current time over a bill to tackle homelessness and rough sleepers yep. in particular. Now, look, you tackle homelessness by making sure that people don't have the sort of problems that lead to homelessness. Weirdly, homelessness is a symptom of a problem rather yep. than the actual problem. So the solution would be, give everyone a home. That, yep. that doesn't yep. actually resolve the issue. But the particular outcry, has been over the sort of things that people could be arrested for and removed for and, and sent to prison for. A, a two thousand five hundred pound fine. Not sure many homeless people have got that sort of spare change. Mm -hmm. I don't think I don't think many working people in a home have got that sort of money to pay. Um, but also for for extreme sort of smelliness. Basically, if there is an extreme odour, they can be moved on. Now, I don't want to be you know standing at a cash point with somebody who is lying on the floor next to me smelling of God knows what and and it's intimidating even you know even if they're just sitting there politely it would be intimidating these are reasonable concerns that mm -hmm. you know law-abiding people have I don't want people sleeping rough on the streets I don't want people begging begging is illegal for a reason um, but and there's no reason for anyone to beg in this country mm -hmm. at all um, but is is a law like this is that the solution I think there's laws that already exist, so I don't think there needs to be any any new law that's brought in and deal, uh, to to deal with it. I think the reality is there needs to be a multidisciplinary and multi-agency approach to dealing with the symptoms of homelessness, as you've said, because you know, people that are out there 
we're all probably two steps away from being homeless or, a lot of people think it's something that happens over there yeah. but often it's people yeah. you know there's a there's a bad you know a bad divorce um yeah. some debt it's a gambling debt there's a bit there's alcoholism there's mental health problems yeah. there's drug I've, problems and these things yeah. can I've, spiral I've, very yeah, quickly I've, I've, i've a friend who had over 20 years service in the royal navy as an officer um, in a very very technical and responsible role he got involved in things um, on operations and had a, a mental health breakdown. His marriage broke down because of that, yep. and he was discharged from the Navy to uh, live nowhere. He was homeless yep. for over a year, uh, and it was only after um, he came out of hospital because he was in um, accident emergency and then admitted to hospital over Christmas and New Year a couple of years ago that the local authorities sat up and with military charities and suddenly found him somewhere to live, and he yep. started to rebuild his, his life again. You know, that's someone who has contributed so much to this nation, and we've let that happen. And, and we know an awful lot of veterans, such as I find coming out yeah. to city streets, just incredibly difficult. And again, marriage breakdowns, and, yeah. and also you know, post traumatic distress from some of the things that people have, you know, they fought for us and seen yeah. horrible things. Um, let me also talk about, so I suppose, you know, a very, very different end of, you know, the age scale as well um, childcare for. Um, uh, two-year-olds, uh, this is being rolled out by the government, much so much fanfare, although, again, they've had to keep reassuring everybody that, uh, yeah, they might actually have enough nursery places. Uh, in case a child that was two uh, on the 1st of April will be entitled uh, from uh, September uh, to just 15 hours. Now, that's just basically two days of childcare mm -hmm. once you've you know, got to work and back. Um, lots of parents would need a lot more than that. Um, it's not free. It's free to you at the time. You're going to pay for it with your taxes, guys. It's subsidised. Um, but we're told by the childcare workers, the nursery, they don't, they simply don't have uh, the, enough places for these children. They're going to extend it to nine months old mm -hmm. plus, uh, and they're looking at needing another 40,000 staff by the end of next year. But they're going to have to start hiring now. We know childcare workers are often paid very little, even though the fees are very high from, from parents. Um, but the, uh, the Eye, got to love the Eye newspaper, they've decided to say the biggest issue here apparently is the government's crackdown on net migration to the UK, fueling a shortage <laughs> of childcare space places. <laughs> Sorry, guys, guys, let me break it to you. 745,000 people in the last full year we've got figures for, which is 2022. That net arriving in this country, that is not a crackdown on net migration. If you want to come here and work as a nursery worker, you've got no problem coming in. But no, it's all because of Brexit. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's madness. You know, the principle of what the government is trying to do is very sound. You know, get, set the conditions so that um, people can get back to work if they need to, to be able to afford their mortgages and uh, the increased cost of living. They, they won't be able to, um, uh, sorry, it throws a little bit more money back yeah. into their pockets again um, in, in what's going on. So it, it can help. But this is where a sound bite level of politics without a detailed plan that brings in a way of recruiting more staff, opening more nurseries and everything else, paying our nursery staff more so that they're, they're incentivized to go in there just doesn't work no. and therefore you need to have a detailed plan behind it um, and unfortunately we're seeing too much politics by soundbite today and very little substance that's coming out from yeah. all sides yeah absolutely as often is the case uh, Philip I really appreciate that thank you very much indeed more from you coming up throughout the show uh, come back to you our lovely audience uh, asking you about the Prime Minister demanding an investigation into the Israeli strikes uh, that killed three British aid workers in Gaza should the UK take a tougher approach to Israel? That is the question I'm asking you. You can give us a call uh, on uh, 0344 1000. You can also send a WhatsApp to that number as well. You can text 87222 and you can tweet us uh, at X on uh, to Talk TV. Um, let's uh, go to some of your text messages. Uh, Julie says, too many people wish Hamas wins the war in Israel. The West should mind its own business. Esme says, we should leave Israel alone and stop poking our noses in wars that don't concern us. Chris says, if Israel is now committing atrocious war crimes, then surely British politicians who voted for the Iraq war must be very worried. Over a million civilians were killed. I think that, again, that's one of those made-up numbers. It's just not true. 136 journalists killed, 94 aid workers were killed. I guess their vote for war, all those deaths don't count because it hasn't, it wasn't committed by Israel. Adrian says, Julia, I take the same view as yourself with regards to the incident. From a propaganda perspective, the media tend to forget the atrocities in the name of war the West undertook in Iraq. Again, Iraq coming up without question. It's double standards. Uh, let's go to Lynn, who is in Glasgow. Hello, Lynn. Good morning, Julia. Good morning. How are you? Very well indeed. What do you want to say then? Do you think we should uh, uh, basically uh, be uh, taking sort of you know, a diff tougher approach? I think we should have taken a tougher approach months ago because 
to get in and try to find Hamas is one thing, but Israel have just decimated that country, and to me that's not right for MD. I don't. It's not because it's Israel. Take out the, the whole Jewish and Palestine. Take all that out of the, the equation. Yeah. The fact is, one country has and decimated another, and the whole world's just stood back and watched it. OK, well, we stood back and watched it because if you believe that Israel has a right of self-defence, they have a right to root, route out, uh, root out Hamas fighters who are, hi who are deliberately hiding underground in their terror cells uh, across Gaza, Gaza City, uh, Rafa and elsewhere. How else, how else does Israel take them on? Well, if they're hiding in tunnels, to me, those tunnels could be very, very easily went through with the military and see when they've cleared them and they know that they're clear and there's no hostages in them, it put cement in them and close them up. I think that's rather easy said than done. You have to identify and find the tunnels. We are talking about a number of tunnels. I think, I believe it's 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 well more, I mean, multiples more than the entire London Underground tube lines in terms of the number of tunnels. They are huge amounts. They've been built for years. They've spent, you know, hundreds of millions, even billions on them. A lot of that aid money going in. I don't think it's as easy. I mean, I'd love it if they could just go in. There was talk about flooding the tunnels at one point, wasn't there? Although they worried that some of the hostages are being no, held in tunnels. There's got to be a better way of the world resolving issues with countries resolving issues with other countries than get in and just... Yeah, but, 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 but con democratic countries... I don't think there's a single instance of two democratic countries going to war with each other. But you're talking about a democratic country going to war with a terrorist organi genocidal organisation that doesn't accept a two-state solution or anything like that. They believe that every Jew, every Israeli should be dead. And not exist. No, what, what? How? How do you take the? They, they are willing to use their own Palestinian civilians as humanitarian cover, so uh, as 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 a human shield. So how do you deal with that? How does Israel protect its own borders if they've still got Hamas sitting there just a few miles away? I understand that, but there's got to be there's got to be a better way. And at the end of the day, even they're going and they're destroying and trying to get Hamas, I totally get that for what they've done on October the 7th. I get that. I totally understand that. It's a, to me, that's a natural human reaction. If yeah. somebody hurts you, you want to hurt them twice as bad. That's a human reaction. But at the end of the day, see all the people that are running Hamas, they're not even in Gaza. Okay. The leaders are all sitting in multi You know, they're sitting all over the world. And I just feel as if Israel just now... They've been, they've been given the back up of the West to go in and do what they've done in Gaza. And I just feel now as if they're going to start dropping bombs in places that we really don't want them dropping bombs in. OK. I'm, I'm thinking I'm thinking that would justify bombing <laughs> bombing the Hamas leaders in uh, in Qatar. But there we are. Really appreciate your call, Lynn. Thank you very much indeed. 11.29 is the time. Uh, up next, we are going to be talking to Israeli government spokesperson Avi Hyman about all of this. Can you justify what Israel had to do? This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to ab and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> there was a suggestion by some 
that maybe it was nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to, was to move on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Good morning and welcome back to the show. This is Talk TV. We're on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And I'm Julia hartley Burr. Still with me in the studio is former military intelligence officer Philip Ingram. And I'd love to get your thoughts on what my next guest had to say. And of course, we are talking today about that uh, airstrike uh, that killed three British aid workers among seven who died in Gaza after the uh, Israeli Defence Force have admitted that they uh, targeted three vehicles that belonged uh, to an aid charity uh, that uh, had been working, giving out aid, World Central Kitchen in Gaza. Uh, formal apology from the leader of the IDF. Uh, condolences expressed, uh, appalled, uh, we're told, uh, by uh, people like Rishi Sunak and David Cameron, Lord Cameron, our Foreign Secretary. Benjamin Netanyahu uh, has admitted that this was a strike from the Israeli Defence Forces as well. But why did it happen? And what's going to happen next? Let's talk to an Israeli government spokesperson, and that is uh, Avi Hyman. Good morning to you, Avi. Good morning, Julia. Thanks Thank for you for me. joining us. Um, there is no doubt at all this is a terrible, terrible tragedy uh, for those who lost their lives, their families and friends and their colleagues, indeed, uh, in this, uh, this aid charity. How on earth did it happen that Israeli forces targeted a convoy of three vehicles from an, a, a, a charity who told the Israeli forces that where they were going to be, where they were going, dropping the aid, going back. They told them their route. One of the vehicles clearly marked with the big logo uh, of, uh, of the charity, the World Central Kitchen charity. How on earth could this have been allowed to happen? So, Julia, let me first um, wish my condolences to, to the families. It's a terrible, terrible tragedy. As you said, um, we have uh, apologised in, in the highest of ways. And uh, this is under investigation. We're going to get to the bottom of exactly what happened. I don't want to preempt that. But uh, preliminary uh, investigations suggest that there was some kind of uh, a misidentification of, uh, of the convoy. Uh, that appears to, what, appears to be what has happened. Um, in a very, very problematic um, war arena where Hamas hides behind uh, aid people, Hamas um, acts as aid people, uses hospitals, mosques, schools, um, youth centers to fire on Israel and to uh, use them as, uh, as human shields. So it's a very, very difficult si situation and it's a very, very tragic scenario. Um, it, it, well, I think most of us who are sensible understand the difficulties uh, of, of fighting a war and fighting a war against terrorists, as you say, who not just use, happily, deliberately use uh, civilians as human shields and have used you know, ambulances and aid vehicles before. However, what was the purpose of this target? I know there's going to be an investigation, but there are some reports in the Middle East that there was the belief that there was a, at least one Hamas fighter among this convoy. Now, even if that were the case, targeting three vehicles, at that point, you're accepting a level of collateral damage. You know there's a minimum of three people in those convoys, just the drivers. 
So even if there was a belief that there was a Hamas fighter, even a senior Hamas figure among those uh, people in that convoy of vehicles, taking out all three vehicles, there would have been an acceptance that there are going to be innocent people who are going to die. Does that count as acceptable collateral damage in this war? No, I, I would not think so at all. In fact, Israel, uh, when it comes to, to ratios of um, combatants, meaning terrorists versus uh, uh, accidental civilian deaths, uh, Israel is is currently, um, the, the Prime Minister said, we're uh, less than one to one ratio, which sounds awful. But when you think about in, in an average war, in any other comparative war, um, those numbers are one to nine. So it's it's a very, very difficult situation. You've got a terrorist organization that's embedded itself within a civilian population for over 16 years. They built a terror tunnel uh, network twice the size of the London Underground. And we're having to, to, to weave through, through this. Now, this is definitely the exception to the rule. And it actually strengthens the rule, the fact that thousands and thousands of, uh, of movements of humanitarian aid are happening all the time. And this, this accident happened, and, and it was awful. But uh, it's the exception to the rule. And military experts, both in England and, uh, and America, have said that Israel is doing its utmost to avoid civilian casualties in a way that no other army has done in modern warfare. But this is a point that I've repeatedly made on social media and, and, and on my show. Why do you think so many people don't accept that? Because look, there, is a, there is an issue in terms of us civilians as armchair generals that we think, you know, not a single innocent person will die in a war and it's terrible and evil if that happens when anyone who's been involved in the military understands that does happen. We're told again and again by many, you know, military folk and legal experts that actually, you know, the, the, some of these targets are legitimate targets because Hamas is using them and is known to be using them uh, for human shields. And you basically can't allow Hamas just to sort of, OK, if they use everyone as a human shield, then we just can't attack them. That, that, and they can act with impunity. Why do you think so many people in the world and so many indeed world leaders don't accept Israel's version of events, Israel's stance on this? Why, do, why is Israel being called a genocidal, murderous regime? I don't want to go into the psyches of, uh, of, of everyone in the world. What I can tell you is that uh, we are committed to our war aims, and I believe that our uh, closest allies, despite what happened yesterday, which was obviously a tragedy, our closest allies, be it Great Britain, be it the United States, uh, stand with us shoulder to shoulder on the mission to destroy Hamas, to bring home the 134 hostages, men, women, children, babies being held, a crime against humanity, and to ensure that Gaza doesn't uh, become a threat to us ever again. Now, what you have to, to remember is that we're surrounded by enemies. We're fighting a war on multiple fronts. It's not just Gaza. It's Gaza, it's Lebanon and Syria to our north. Um, it's it's uh, the Houthis in Yemen to our south. And just yesterday, um, a drone came over from Iraq. Again, another Iranian proxy. The uh, Iranian uh, terror axis wants to destroy us. They want to wipe Israel off the state of the map. And as the Iranians say, um, they call uh, Israel the small Satan and the West the great Satan. So they, they, they want to come for you next. So I don't understand why people would want to, to go uh, to buy into the Hamas narrative, to buy into the Hamas numbers. What Hamas wants to do is they want maximum civilian casualties on both sides so that the war is stopped by pressure applied on Israel so that they can remain in power and do what they want to do, what they've said they'll do, which is perpetrate October 7th again and again and again. We can't allow that to happen, nor can Great Britain. Well, but we've had, you know, condemnation from Rishi Sunak, from uh, uh, Joe Biden in America, Joe Biden, of course, being the leader of the most significant ally of Israel. How concerned is Israel about the... the, the ugh, it's awful when we're talking about people who've died. The PR on this. How concerned are they about the risk also of arms shipments uh, being limited and, lack, and, and losing that although it was already dissipating, diplomatic support from key allies like the US and the UK? So we're not fighting this war because of how it looks. We're fighting this war for the sake of the future of our country. This is an existential fight. We're fighting for our very existence. There are enemies, there are buzzards flying around us, waiting for us to blink because they want to destroy us. So to, to paraphrase uh, Winston Churchill, if we need to, we'll go alone. We don't want to. We understand that values-wise, we stand 
on the same page as you. We understand that the people that perpetrated October 7th are the same idea, have the same ideology than those people that perpetrated the 7th of the 7th in London. We understand that, um, to quote uh, the former uh, British chief rabbi, uh, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, what starts with the Jews rarely ends with the Jews. We saw that Hamas came onto the world scene with suicide bombs blowing up uh, buses all over Israel. And then we saw the scenes on October 7th, uh, on, on the 7th of the 7th in London, when uh, a, a red double-decker bus was blown up in the same way. So our war is, is your war in the sense that okay. we need to win it. Really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Avi Hyman, he's a government uh, spokesman for Israel. Thank you for that. Quick thought uh, from Philip Ingram on that. Yeah, well, two elements come out. One, you know, the Iranian trying to destabilise, uh, Iranians trying to destabilise the whole of the region, and that's something that impacts all of us. Yeah. Uh, and the second thing is, and a people, I think they're people, funding virtually pretty much every terror group available. I, I, exactly, and that that has and will continue to impact in in Europe and and the UK and at home. But the other thing that people forget is that since Israel came into being, it's almost been in a permanent state of national survival with all of the threats mm. that are around it. And therefore, they've got a different approach to military tasks it, than it, we it, have. Hence conscription, etc., etc. Because we can indeed. sit here quite happily protesting about stuff. They can't. They have to fight I for I think we'd feel peace. rather differently if it would happen yes. to us. I've always said that. Thank you very much indeed, Philip. Uh, now, um, just go back to our social question for you. I'd love to hear from your thoughts that the Prime Minister has demanded an investigation into the Israeli uh, strike that killed three British aid workers in Gaza. I want to know, should the UK take a tougher approach to Israel? Uh, you can give us a call, 0344 1000 You can WhatsApp us on the same number. You can text 87222 or get in touch on Twitter or X, whatever it is, this week at Talk TV. Um, um, Ian has got in touch to say it's sad regarding the British aid workers. However, they chose to be in a war zone. Sunak is just hoping to gain favour with the Saturday marching mob. Chris says there is a war. You can expect casualties when you roam around the streets at city in war. Um, bombs do not differentiate regardless of motives, except the Israelis have said they did target this convoy. Um, Kanna says I don't think any country has the right to tell others how to defend themselves. Civilians die in war. It has always happened and it will always happen. If you go into an active war zone it's the chance you take uh, let's go to the phone lines now abdullah is in ilford and wants to have his say good morning to you abdullah morning julia good okay morning. thank you very much you for joining us yeah what do you think do you think we should take a tougher approach to israel we should have taken a tougher approach months ago i mean they've been killing uh, aid workers over 200 been killed up to date anyway it's only now because the british uh, citizens have been involved yeah that we uh, care we, we, sorry you're saying that's only, only now they're foreigners is that we care that, that, that's that's what that's the only reason we we care. But otherwise, realistically, if we've got any moral height, if we've got any moral morals, we've got humanity in us, then surely we should have been um, stamping out. We should have been condemning this from day one. Because condemning so condemning killed. condemning the killing of aid workers or condemning the killing of uh, what what Israel is doing generally civilian deaths. What? Continuously, they, they've got they've got targeted weapons. They they, they yeah. like when they went, when they went to Lebanon, they took out Hamas um, uh, militants, as it were, you know, mm -hmm. um, and they took them out with, with strategic weaponry. Now, why is it that they're using? They've been using dumb bombs. They've taken out journalists. They've taken out doctors. Do you think nurses, they're deliberately people? targeting those people? I, I, I put it this way. I mean, no, no, it's a crazy they, question. Not, do you think they're deliberately targeting those people? Uh, yes, I yes, you I do. do. You think I Israel do. thinks? Here's an idea. We want to keep the world on our side. Let's target aid workers, doctors, civilians. Yeah, let's do journalists because that will really help our cause. Do you think that, are they that? I mean, you cannot like Israel, but do you think they're stupid as well? I think they're psychopathic li li liars. You think, that, you think the Israeli government are psychopathic liars? What do you of think of are. Hamas? I mean, the, the thing is, look. Uh, what do you Julia, think of the Hamas? Thing is, this, the thing is, Hamas are, 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 are a. Um, a group which came about because of the continuous killing in Gaza. Before that, previously, there have been so many... You're giving me a history of Hamas. What do you, you just told me that you think that... What you think of, of the Israeli government, the psychopathic liars. What do you think of... What do you think of Hamas? Don't give me a history. What do you think of Hamas? Hamas are a reaction to all the killing... That Hamas are a reaction. Place. You don't of think that I'm Hamas are psychopathic, murderous, genocidal terrorists? Any, anybody who kills any, takes any innocent life should be locked up. That's the bottom line. Regardless Anybody. of what they call Hamas. Yeah, Do you think that Hamas, Hamas are a terrorist group? That's what the UK has prescribed them. As no, the I said, do you think they're a terrorist group? 
I think they're a reaction, like I said. They're a they're reaction. reaction to all the killing. They are, are they a terrorist the reaction, Abdullah? If you, if, if you seem to be. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You can. I think it's perfectly legitimate for people to have a big reaction and to have and have strong feelings on how Israel is propagating this war in in Gaza. It's totally legitimate to have that debate. I find it interesting that you seem to find it so much harder to be critical of Hamas, a group that have they they blatantly, openly said and in their constitution that they are genocidal against the Jewish people, the Israeli people. No, I, I, I would say that, um, that, that the Israeli state is, is doing far worse than Hamas has ever done. You, what, what, you think the Israeli state? You think the Israeli state are going in, taking hostages, murdering children, deliberately cutting their throats or whatever, raping and mutilating people? You, th you think that they're doing that? They are. They have you been think they documented. Are? And it's documented. Then, documented Julia, on Twitter that. by not, Hamas. It's not by the, it's, the, the thing is, Julia, look, we can't go, you can't just accept whatever Israel says as, as, as um, the truth. No, no, I don't accept what Israel says, but I definitely don't accept what Hamas says. But lots of the stuff you'll see online that looks like it's really, really, you know, solid stuff is simply Hamas propaganda. They've been caught out again and again. But the thing is, uh, Julia. Look, the thing is, look, I mean, I don't know if you've if you've watched. I, I watch all the news channels. I go through, so I got a whole range of different uh, views, different mm -hmm. angles. I mean, right? And you, you, it, it, there's no denying that thousands of innocent men, women, yes. children, pregnant women yes. have been have lost their lives, and and millions displaced. No and, but that, but that could stop tomorrow. Hamas could release all the hostages, and they could lay down weapons and say they want to accept a two-state solution and stop bombing and stop trying to attack Israel. That. We could do that tomorrow. We couldn't do that tomorrow, Julia, because what could happen if, if, if Hamas lay down their weapons yep. and, and Israel carry on acting and, re, re, um, and keep on building... If Hamas lay down their weapons, 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 Israel would be forced by the Western community to, to, to re retreat, no question. But, 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 Hamas, but the thing is, even before Hamas were in existence, Julia, the, Israel was still killing innocent civilians in, in the Gaza and the West Bank. They were still locking them up. They still locked them up as we speak today. Over 7,000 people have been locked oh, up. I wonder in what the they've Gaza been situation. locked up for. I wonder. Um, Abdul, we'll have to leave it that. I'm only leaving this. Do call in again. I'm only leaving this because I've got to go to a break. But I really appreciate you getting in touch. But I'm... I'm, I'm I, I think people are quite right if they want to be critical of, of, of Israel. That, but I, I find it quite astonishing that you're not so critical of Hamas. I really do find that astonishing. Thank you very much for your call, though. This is Talk. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. 
And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, absolutely. It was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. And uh, good morning to you. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. This is a talk. I'm Julia Harley Bristol. With me in the studio is Philip Ingram. Get his thoughts at the end of uh, this quick chat, but we've just got a few more minutes left in this hour. I want to talk about, uh, well, the claims from the Labour Party uh, that, uh, well, it is, it is Tory policies and economic policies that are hammering British businesses with a net loss of some 40,000 businesses. Of course, it's small business. Anyone walk down their local high street, they would know that are losing out. Let's talk to Martin Mate. He's National Chair of the Federation of Small Businesses. And Joe us now. Good morning to you. Good morning, Julia. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. So, look, how bad is it out there? I am seeing an awful lot of boarded up shops at the moment and shops that survived lockdown somehow, survived the energy prices and now just can't seem to make ends meet anymore. Yeah, I don't think these figures come as a massive surprise. I mean, when you look at insolvencies, they're at their uh, the highest they've been for the last four years. And confidence is very low. We're recording some of the lowest figures we've seen in a decade. And one of the major factors that is causing this problem is big businesses not paying their bills on time. Uh -huh. They are consistently paying slowly. And I think government, rather than wringing their hands and worrying about where the, this issue originates, is they should act on payment. They should make sure that People get paid on time. They deal with employment costs. And in the end, encourage investment. Because if I'm a business in this current climate, a business owner, it is a time where most of the indicators look gloomy. Yeah, absolutely. The payment on time thing, God, I've talked about this on the show for, for, since we started in 2016, I think. And it is extraordinary. The big businesses are basically able to say, yeah, well, we know we signed a contract that says we'll pay you in 30 days or, or three months or whatever. But actually, you know, well, we're going to pay you in six months. And um, if if you don't like it, we won't do business with you again. And people, of I mean, small business owners, are basically over a barrel, aren't they? And, you know, some of the bigger supermarkets have done this. This could be really simple. Make it illegal. You have to pay everything within 30 days. Full stop. Nothing to discuss. They could, the government could sort this out tomorrow, couldn't they? Absolutely. I mean, there are, there, you can imagine as an employer, employee rather, if your company decided at the end of the month, they just yeah. couldn't be bothered paying you yeah. on time. Don't worry about thought, it. <laughs> you can wait till the following month. How would you feel about that with the bills rolling in? Yeah. We see people running businesses who sometimes don't pay themselves. They have to borrow money from their own homes. And in many cases, their homes are on the line if they fail to, if their business fails to survive this kind of pressure. They're having to borrow twice as much yeah. as they normally need just simply to cover poor payment. And, and of course, also with interest rates much higher, that is a much bigger deal. So you know, I think that, I believe Rishi Sunak has been in the building uh, today, which is why we're actually not uh, in the studio uh, that we're normally in. It's going to be played out at, uh, at Sun on Sun TV at seven o'clock this evening. But I just want to know, like, um, what, if there's one thing you could say to Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, for now, you know, that he could do to help small businesses, what would it be? Well, I would say, look, you've got five and a half million business owners out there. They're highly motivated. They're people that would support you if you could show that you are really serious about this issue. Get out today and prove that the rhetoric doesn't matter anymore. You've only got a few months left to demonstrate you're serious about this issue and make a difference. 
Okay, lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Great to hear from you. Federation of Small Businesses National Chair, that's Martin McTague. Um, Philip Ingram, I mean, this is such an issue, isn't it? And everyone who goes to their local high street will know. I mean, remember during lockdown, people trying to support their local businesses. Many of them really struggling through those energy prices hit really hard. Businesses that are big, being able to use their power to not pay um, and you know, struggling with wages going up, all their costs going up. How do we help business? Because it's the backbone of the nation. Well, yeah, I, I run a small business, I've run a number of small businesses and, and it, it's difficult. It's very difficult. And the, the lit payments is, is one issue that's in there. But you know, I do think this 40,000 that's come out is another political soundbite. Yeah. Um, because I, I did some research before we came on and putting it into context, you know, five and a half million um, businesses registered in the last year, 585,000 thousand dissolved yeah 49 percent are um supposed to be of the of the of the 5.5 million yeah. are uh, vat registered that doesn't reflect doesn't, that doesn't, so it's a sound doesn't, bite. The, the, the figures don't bite. necessarily add up no. um well no doubt we'll talk about this many more times to come philip Gimber, thank you very much plenty more coming up this is talk tv Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, son. Oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think but, like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Stories that really matter. To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday.
Good afternoon to you. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. We are on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Uh, Rishi Sunak has uh, demanded answers from Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu after an Israeli airstrike killed seven workers, including three British citizens. The head of Israel's army has apologised for what he called a grave mistake and promised a full investigation into the incident. We'll talk more about that. Plus, J.K. Rowling will not be prosecuted under Scotland's controversial new hate crime law that came into force on Monday. Police Scotland have said that she challenged them to arrest her for stating the fact that trans women are men and frequent flyers should face higher taxes in a bid to reduce demand for air travel. That's according to a committee of MPs who no doubt spend plenty of time enjoying business class travel at your and my expense. More on all of those big stories. Uh, first though, let's get the latest news headlines with Holly Hudson. Talk TV News at 12. Good afternoon. The three British aid workers who've been killed in Gaza are being remembered as heroes by the charity they worked for. John Chapman, James Henderson and James Kirby were among seven volunteers for the World Central Kitchen in an airstrike Israel said was unintended. Military analyst Sean Bell told Talk TV Israel needs to show it's willing to allow aid into Gaza. This is not just an accident, as you've suggested. Unfortunately, what uh, Israel's made no secret of the fact that it's trying to, it, 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 not, um, it does not want aid to flow into the hands of Hamas, and therefore is being somewhat um, difficult about allowing access. And the danger is when these strikes happen, it does point the finger of, of blame potentially at the Israelis who should be doing more to ensure that the aid's getting through to what is an escalating humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Well, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says he's appalled by the death and has summoned the Israeli ambassador for the first time in 12 years. And United Nations officials say they're gravely concerned by the situation. This incident is yet a further reminder that Israel needs to do much more to protect humanitarian personnel and facilities in Gaza. We join other countries who lost citizens in this incident in calling for a transparent and comprehensive investigation. This must not happen again. Dozens of people remain trapped as a huge rescue operation continues after Taiwan's powerful earthquake. Seven people are now known to have died and more than 700 people injured after the island was struck by the 7.4 magnitude quake, causing buildings to collapse and triggering tsunami warnings. A major new survey has found around one in seven adults in England have been waiting at least a year for a hospital appointment, test or treatment. The figures are even higher among those aged 16 to 24 and those with disabilities, with around one in five people in those two categories failing to be seen within 12 months. The study was conducted between January and February this year by NHS England and the Office for National Statistics. Royal Mail has warned up to 1,000 jobs could be lost as part of plans to slash services. In a proposal put forward to the industry watchdog, Royal Mail plans to scrap second-class letter deliveries on Saturdays and reduce all non-first-class letter deliveries to every other day. It's a step back from previous calls to do away with Saturday services altogether. The business believes the changes would save up to £300 million a year and hopes it wouldn't need to make any compulsory redundancies. And visitors will be able to tour parts of Balmoral Castle for the first time ever. Set in the Scottish Highlands, it's widely believed to have been Queen Elizabeth II's and will be offering guided tours for the residents still used by the royal family. Tickets are expected to sell for at least £100 a person, with the palace open to guests until September. That's the latest weather time now with Isabel Lang. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello again. We've got an area of low pressure that's stuck across more central parts of the country, bringing some persistent and heavy rain, particularly across parts of northern England and southern Scotland. Quite a chilly wind actually coming in from the east as well, so not pleasant there. Whereas to the south, well, not a lot of sunshine, but a little bit breaking through with some showers. The heaviest showers, I should think, for East Anglia up through uh, Lincolnshire into Yorkshire, some quite lively ones to end the day. But those, again, fading into the evening. Warmest in the south, chilliest across the north. 
Now, as we head through this evening and tonight, well, the rain in northern areas persists for a while, but it does tend to ease a little bit, whereas to the south, there'll be some heavier bursts of rain running in from the southwest. At times, really quite heavy, possibly thundery, and they'll gradually grind to a halt again across parts of northern England, north Wales and the Irish Sea. To the south, that's where the heaviest downpours will be. You could well find some quite tricky travelling conditions. Again, that contrast in temperature, quite a warm start across southern areas. Wet, particularly through the morning rush hour across some southern counties of England. Watch out for that particular area which clears away otherwise it'll be a sort of drying up process for a time before more rain returns to the southwest later again a contrast in temperature chilliest in the north times radio sponsors talk tv weather Good afternoon. Welcome back to the show. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. This is Talk on TV, on radio, online, or on your smart speaker. If you're just wondering, I'm in a very different studio. We are back in the old radio studio, folks. Uh, we'll be back here again, no doubt, very soon. Uh, but that is why um, Sir Ronald Porton has been in the building today. Uh, we're not able to get into our main studio. But uh, uh, Kevin Alex will be back in the main studio in an hour's time. In the meantime, lots more to talk about. And joining me for all the chat is Philip Ingram, former military intelligence officer, who's been joining me all morning. Good afternoon Good to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, we're going to be talking about other stories in a few moments, but obviously the biggest story of the day, we've been talking about it every hour, uh, is, of course, this Israeli uh, airstrike that uh, killed seven aid workers, including uh, three Brits. I mean, look, everyone's hearts must go out to these aid mm -hmm. workers. And no matter what you think about what's going on in Gaza, between Israel and Hamas, you know, these aid workers, incredibly brave people, they have been named as uh, John Chapman, James Kirby and James Henderson, all ex-military. Uh, two of them have served in the Royal Marines. Uh, another was actually a sniper marksman uh, but incredibly brave uh, men going in to help aid workers mm -hmm. uh, at the world central kitchen a well-known u.s uh, based aid agency taking aid into civilians to keep them alive doing amazing work uh, they we understand had given their position given their location their where, where they were going to travel uh, to the israeli defense forces is reports in, the, in the, uh, the Middle East are claiming that the Israelis believed that there was a Hamas, uh, a fighter on board. Doesn't explain, I suppose, the targeting of three separate vehicles, as we have seen. Israel, as we've heard, apologies, um, uh, saying there'll be a full investigation, demands from David Cameron, uh, other world leaders, of course, the US President Joe Biden, for a full independent investigation, not just by the Israelis. But um, you're a man who's actually been in war. Mm. You've actually fought in wars. Most of us passing comment and pontificating like I do on this stuff, have never been in there. We hear a lot about the fog of war, collateral damage. What's your reaction to this story? Um, yeah, it's very difficult and my heart goes out to you, the families of the individuals that have lost their lives and the other couple of hundred aid workers that have lost their lives over, over the last six but, months. But it didn't the, make the, the news because they weren't foreign nationals. Correct, and the, and the thousands of Palestinian civilians that you know, have been abused into a position by Hamas in what's going on here. The fog of war is very real. What do we know about this attack? Looking at it, it precision attacked three vehicles and therefore the Israelis were using precision weapons. Um, uh, and this therefore, wasn't, they, they weren't like caught up in a bomb that happened no, on the roadside. No, or, or an artillery yeah. piece that, happened, that, that went onto the roadside. So you know, either the Israelis believed that there were Hamas in those vehicles and using them and they had to be very senior Hamas if they were willing to take the risk of collateral damage of, of aid So for workers. a bog standard Hamas fighter who's just left a tunnel, that, that wouldn't be something no. that would be targeted? No, not at all. Or there's been a, a complete and utter mess up in um, misidentifying uh, elements of, of a convoy. And remember this was at night, everyone says, oh, but it had its logo on the roof. Some of the sensors that are, that are used will not pick up something that hasn't got uh, 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 ink on it or, or paint on yeah. it that will, will light up at night. So it, it's, it's very easy to criticise, it's very difficult to uh, actually understand exactly what happened. You know, from what I've read around the place, I think there's an element of this being a complete mess up. I think there's an element of the Israelis becoming complacent about the targeting process that they should go through and rushing through elements of it um, and therefore not being as diligent as they possibly can be. Um, and uh, this has allowed false intelligence or inaccurate intelligence to come in and, and, and target mm -hmm. this and has ended up in these 
this tragic event. Okay, I mean, it is it is indeed a very, very tragic event. And uh, of course, there will be investigations. Do you think, I mean, the question we're asking our audience today, and I'll put the question again to you as well, but the Prime Minister here, the Yushi Snack, has demanded an investigation into the Israeli strike that killed three British aid workers in Gaza. Should the UK take a tougher approach to Israel? That's my question to you today. You can give us a call on 0344 499 You can WhatsApp us on the same number. You can text at 8722 or you can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Should we, Philip, should we take a tougher approach to Israel? I, I think we should be robust in our approach to Israel so we act as Israel's conscience, um, ensuring that they uh, can convince us that they're not taking shortcuts in the targeting process, that they're doing everything that they can to check that the intelligence that they're getting is That not every end justifies every means. Correct. Um, and, and the, because it's too easy whenever a, a country is caught up in a conflict and with all the emotions that are around it for people to go, oh, it, it doesn't matter. You, we, we just need to rush well, this Well, I mean, we did this. I mean, after, you know, 9-11 nine, nine with, with joining the Americans in Afghan, Afghan, Afghanistan and, and then Iraq later on as well. I mean, oh, you know, you know we, the, the, the biggest element of the group think was, you know, the, the turning of the dossier, which I saw out of Defence mm -hmm. Intelligence, which was a very good piece of intelligence into the dodgy dossier when it came out from a political endpoint saying this is what we need to achieve. Yeah, indeed. Well, look, do get in touch. Love to hear your thoughts. As I say, I'll get you on the phones would be great. A three double four four double nine one thousand. We'll get to more of your messages uh, very soon as well. Uh, time is eleven minutes past twelve. Let's turn our attention back to well, events on Monday. The uh, new hate crime law that came into force in Scotland, which does actually everyone's oh, it's happening in Scotland. No, no, it impacts people across the whole of the UK. Someone who doesn't like something that I say in a tweet on air here on talk uh, could report it to the Scottish police and ask them to get in touch with the Met Police here in London where I am right now and uh, say could you please investigate Julia for a hate crime I might end up being prosecuted I could end up I could technically end up going to prison or I could end up with a non-crime hate incident but I might not even know about that uh, well yesterday police in Scotland announced that they wouldn't be prosecuting JK Rowling for a series of tweets that she put out on Monday April Fool's Day, interestingly, uh, in which she identified, well, mockingly, a number of high-profile trans figures, including the rapist Isla Bryson uh, and uh, uh, the model Monroe Bergdorf and uh, TV presenter uh, India Willoughby, uh, as all being men. And uh, basically said, if you want to arrest me, that's fine. I look forward to being arrested. Well, let's talk about this right now with Ben Jones. He's from the Free Speech Union and joins us. Good afternoon to you, Ben. Hi, Julia. Um, I have to say, an awful lot of us uh, are cheering J.K. Rowling on for basically just saying, I'm not going to be cowed by this new law. I'm happy to go to prison. Something I've said for a very long time, I'm happy to go to prison for the refusal to state something I know not to be true. A man cannot become a woman. A woman cannot become a man. Therefore, a trans woman is not a woman. Um, the decision of the police in Scotland to say that her tweets were not a hate crime and she would not be investigated, did that uh, surprise you? I think probably what Police Scotland are going to do is try and find the most horrifying and outrageous example of hate that they can in the coming weeks uh, so that this act does not become even more of a laughing stock than it already is. Uh, we've seen in the first 24 hours 3,800 complaints and the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents had warned before the act came into effect that it would be used by vexatious uh, complainants, which I think is code for trans activists, uh, and that is exactly what we have seen. It really is a censor's charter that is a nightmare for freedom of speech in Scotland. And J.K. Rowling has made herself, in an incredibly courageous way, a human shield yeah. uh, for the millions of people who think as she does, uh, as I do, as you do, uh, that you cannot change your sex. No, I don't think it. No, this thing, people say it's protected belief. I don't think it. I know it to be true. It is a fact. And this is the thing. We must not use their language. We don't go down their, their route. But this is the thing. You say it's a laughing stock, this law, but it's also incredibly sinister. I mean, I, I wrote a piece for The Sun about this today. I mean, it is, we, we use the term Orwellian far too often, but this truly is Orwellian. You know, children being allowed to basically knock on their parents uh, in their own home. What is said in your own home can still be something uh, that you could be, uh, you know, prosecuted by the police for. And again, like with the hate crime laws in the, in the rest of the UK, which are equally chilling on our, on our ability to conduct free speech. Um, it's all about the eye of the beholder or the ear of the beholder. If someone perceives that something is offensive, not even to them, but they think it might be offensive to someone else, um, that, that that alone is enough for them to make a complaint to the police, which I'm assuming is what an awful lot of those 3,800 uh, were. I mean, this would, this would uh, I presume, I think, that, that, for instance, in Scotland, there are no burglaries, there are no rapes, there is no shoplifting, you know, there are no muggings. They've got the police are sitting around 
twiddling their thumbs with nothing else to do but deal with hurty tweets. Well, on an average day in Scotland, about 24 people can expect to have their houses burgled. So I'd say good luck to anyone who's in that unfortunate position in the last few days at getting the police to come round to your house, uh, much less to find and prosecute the burglar, uh, because the police have promised that they're going to investigate every single complaint uh, made under the Hate Crime Act, and there are these pop-up hate crime reporting shops that have been set up across Scotland, including in what we might euphemistically call an adult shop in Glasgow. So you can <laughs> go in... Shop. Uh, a sex shop and you can go in and dob somebody in and obviously the trans stuff is is, is the main area of yeah. contention at the moment and Jacob Rowling has, has very courageously spoken out about this and defied the police to arrest her but the act also removes what's called the dwelling defense i.e what you say the words you say in your own home to your own family uh, and in addition to making transgender a protected characteristic under this act it also includes age so yeah. If you are in your own home and you call your own husband or your own father or a member of your family a grumpy old git, that can be an offence under yeah. this act if the offended party decides to go to this sex shop in Glasgow and report you for it. Yeah, I'm assuming also, you know, I can say that no one under 20's opinion is worth anything at all. Uh, that presumably would be, would be a, a crime on that basis. But this is it. We've lost the nuances of conversation because I think all right-minded people would think it was right that someone who is abusive, harassing, targeting somebody because for, for any reason at all it, it doesn't have to be a reason for you know race or or gender or uh, or, or, or age or, or disability or anything just say just targeting someone that that should be a crime people anyway you know, it took years for women to get the right to you know, have you know domestic uh, you know abuse and harassment uh, dealt with and we finally understood that you know. but if you're if you're threatening someone if you are inciting violence towards people those are already crimes why do we need to have new crimes, whether it's in Scotland or across the rest of the UK, and we've certainly got some big worries about the extension of these, these laws uh, under Labour, given that Labour supported these measures in Holyrood, um, to, to actually just, you know, because someone just doesn't like what someone says. Because we used to say when I was a kid, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Now we consider words somehow to be as bad as physical violence or threats, even when those words are just sort of someone giving their opinion. Yes, absolutely. It's a complete nonsense. And obviously, uh, yesterday, there's been this unfortunate incident where somebody has uh, daubed racist graffiti near the First Minister's house, which is dealt with under under existing law. It, it doesn't then follow to me uh, that because people want to go and do that sort of thing, a tiny number of people want to go and do that sort of thing, that we need to criminalise people who, uh, I was about to say believe, but you're quite right, who know the reality of biological sex and who want to discuss those issues and talk about it and to criticize transgender ideology mm -hmm. it's a complete nonsense it doesn't follow at all and if you look at the statements that are being made by uh, scottish government ministers defending this legislation they're basically along the lines of that uh, this is not going to be as bad as you think it will be that seemed to be the line on monday yeah. um, and yet now we've seen almost four thousand uh, complaints so far in the first 24 hours and that figure of course is now i don't know 12 or 15 hours old um, and so there may be thousands more. Yeah. Indeed, there, there surely will be. It is an absolute absurd. I would love them to have hubs for us to report rather more serious crimes. I mean, the response from J.K. Rowling to the uh, police in Scotland saying they weren't going to be questioning her about um, her tweets, that they did not break the law. She said, I hope every woman in Scotland who wishes to speak up for the reality and importance of biological sex will be reassured by this announcement. And I trust that all women, irrespective of profile or financial means, as a very famous billionaire, um, will be treated equally under the law. And that's the issue, isn't it? Because she's basically daring them, like, come and get me, you know, good luck. Come and, yeah. come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. But you know from the work that you do at the Free Speech Union um, and, and the incredibly important work you do, and you are director of case operations and outreach at the union, that this isn't just happening to celebrities. Um, this is very rich people, famous people. This is happening to ordinary people going about their daily lives all of the time. Now, I'm a member of the Free Speech Union. Uh, I, I'm also involved uh, with the union, an unpaid position. I, I made a donation. I, what, first thing I did, I woke up on Monday morning and I made a donation to Free Speech Union because I know you've opened a new office in Edinburgh. You're going to have to deal with all these cases. And, and there are so many thousands of people who are basically losing their livelihoods, losing their jobs because of laws like this and the way and the, the the impact on free speech tell us the work that you guys do and 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 how much of an explosion in casework you think you're going to have 
That's correct. In just four years, we have dealt with two and a half thousand cases. I'm happy to say that we are successful and get a favourable outcome 74% of the time when we're helping people. Uh, but we have seen a surge of new uh, members joining up north of the border from Scotland, 600 members uh, in just five or six days. Uh, people are so concerned about what's going on and about what this act is going to mean for them. It's worth saying as well about Jacob Rowling, although the police have now backed down and they said that, the, that there doesn't seem to be an imminent danger that she's going to be arrested or prosecuted, there is every chance that there will be a non-crime hate incident yep. that has been recorded against her after this thread that she posted on Twitter. And the police and the Scottish government seem to be dodging questions on that. Um, and it's worth perhaps explaining that a non-crime hate incident is something that is recorded by the police against your name. You might never know that such a record has been made against you. And it might only be when you apply for a job that requires an enhanced background check that you discover that an NCHI has been recorded against you. And we've helped people have lost job offers um, because of this record that they never even knew existed. Uh, and we're currently helping Murdo Fraser, the Conservative MSP, get one of these records uh, removed against his name that Police Scotland have recorded after he said that uh, changing your gender was like identifying as a cat. It was a complete nonsense. Yeah. And very recently, we've helped uh, south of the border, Rachel McLean, the Deputy Conservative Chairman, uh, have an NCHI removed against her name. So these things are possible. And, and, and there, we know are, how good it does. there are hundreds of thousands of these non-crime hate incidents that are recorded against people. This People think, oh, goodness me, it's just a silly culture war. You silly people are making, getting your knickers in a twist about nothing. People are losing their jobs. People are people are, are being sort of cancelled, you know, uh, completely. They're losing their livelihoods. But also, millions more are just kind of staying quiet. I know you've also done a poll, uh, it was in the papers yesterday, yeah. about people being forced to attend to look, diversity training, laughably named diversity training. I think that someone once asked me to go on some unconscious bias training. I pointed out that all of my biases were completely conscious and I was very happy with all of them, thank you very much. Um, but people being asked to go on this training and thinking, I, I can't give my honest views because I, I'm going to be sacked. And we've dealt with people who have been told that they can give their honest views about the training that they're being forced to sit through by their employer. Uh, they do so. They criticise the idea of white privilege and they ask questions like, is there black privilege in mm. Ghana? Uh, as in the case of uh, Simon Isherwood, who we helped and, and uh, won his case for. Uh, and we've also had, uh, for instance, the case of Carl borg who uh, he was a bank manager. Uh, and uh, he was punished for, uh, for the comments he made in one of these training yeah. sessions. And we, we see this all the time of people trying to express their views in the most moderate way or stumbling over their words and then apologising for something they've said if they've been inarticulate or if they've caused offence uh, accidentally. But still people are losing their jobs and people are being fired after decades working for their employer. Uh, and it's very difficult if you're in your mid-50s, say, uh, and you've worked somewhere for 10, 15, 20 years, and there's a gap on your CV and you can't get a reference and you've been fired unjustly. Yeah. Uh, it's very difficult then to move on. And Absolutely. people then have to go to the employment tribunal. And that might take And this is the years. thing. This isn't just a you know, billionaire uh, celebrity authors. This is real. This is happening right now. It's happening probably in your company that you work for. It might be happening in the company I work for. This is happening everywhere. We need to, we need to deal with it. Um, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you very much, Ben Jones from the Free Speech Union. Um, quick word from Bill of Ingram. I mean, you strike me as a man. You, you know, take no nonsense. But there are a lot of people who feel that way. But they're still scared of saying what they really think. And we're not talking about people, you know, being racist or sexist or transphobic. People just saying facts. And it's a culture that you're getting across the board. You, know, The Scottish have put this into a legal framework and I'm gobsmacked that the police can afford to open reporting centres in different different yeah. places. But it's a, it's, a, it's a sad reflection of where priorities are in society. Um, you know, the Ministry of Defence has got a diversity and inclusiveness um, senior two-star civil servant who's paid over £100,000 yeah. a year and has a complete department of people just looking at, um, at, at this. Now, is it that important? Well, yeah, I mean, for most of us. But then we're told we're just, we're just exercising culture war by fighting against it. No, no, we we didn't bring the law in. That wasn't us. Anyway, 12.24 is the time. Let's get back to our question for our audience about whether the UK should take a tougher approach to Israel. Uh, this after the Prime Minister here has demanded an investigation into the Israeli airstrike that killed three British aid workers in Gaza, among seven aid workers who died. Um, uh, Paddy has got in touch and said, Julia, as a former soldier, I've done this type of work myself. It's tragic, but these blokes were ex-forces. They knew the risks of operating in a war zone when you're on the circuit it's big boy rules 
because it's a big boys game. Yeah, but being deliberately targeted. Uh, Kay says, I think the PM's attention should be in the UK and he should keep his nose out of other countries. Adam says, no, we should back Israel. They make mistakes, but we need to look at the bigger picture and get rid of Hamas. Uh, Molly says, simply don't go into a war zone. As simple as that. Ken says, I believe Israel should continue its campaign to root out evil and radical Islamic ideology. What happened is a mistake. The UK should understand and give more support to Israel and cancel the hate protests in London against Jews. Uh, right now, let's uh, go to the phones. You can call any time, 0344 1000 Don't forget, you can also text 87222 and get in touch at Talk TV. Uh, but Brian is in Cambridgeshire and has got on the phones. Good afternoon to you, Brian. Good afternoon, Julia. Thank you so much for calling in. So, should we take a tougher approach to, the, to Israel? Of course not. Why not? Because the Israel are not the enemy. Who Israel, is? What, the, the, the Israelis, Netanyahu in particular, said many, many times, now it's Israel and we're fighting your war. Why aren't we believing this? Do you think, though, look, I, I believe that you know Israel is fighting the good fight. I think their war is justified. I agree with their self to, right to self-defence. I, I understand there are going to be, as an awful phrase, collateral damage deaths of civilians. Does this feel like collateral damage? Or was this, uh, I mean, do, do we still need to hold our allies, even if we support their war efforts, to account for mistakes they make, even if we accept it was a mistake? Well, mistakes happen. I mean, we, sh we should be the first ones not to be throwing stones in glass houses. I mean, the Second World War is an example. We deliberately targeted German civilians. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands of German civilians were killed by British and American bombers. Yeah. Look what happened to Dresden. Did we care whether we were bombing hospitals, kindergarten? We didn't care. It and was all out war. Numerous civilians also died in Iraq and Afghanistan, although they weren't being deliberately targeted. And that's the key issue, isn't it? Well, it is. I, I, I was in the first Gulf War, and what the Israel, I think what the Israelis are doing, the way that they're, they're trying to avoid civilian casualties is commendable because we weren't doing it in the Gulf. We, we're holding them to a higher account than, than we ourselves operate in. Well, that's always the case when it comes to the Jews, isn't it? I mean, anybody can do anything unless you're a Jew. This this is kind of the feeling I get, but I, I still think it's very important we do hold all governments to account, including our own, including the Israelis. But there does seem to be a higher a higher account held for you know a higher standard for for Israel than not just Hamas. We should have a higher standard for a democratic government over a, a terrorists, but but than any government in the world, including our own. Yes, we we should hold them to account, but not during the campaign. OK, interesting. Thank you very much. It's interesting to hear from another ex-veteran as well. Uh, Brian in Cambridgeshire, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, 12.27 is the time. Uh, coming up, uh, we are going to be uh, talking about what is going on in schools, Ofsted inspections, and, oh gosh, will the National Education Union be going on strikes again? And, oh, will anyone even notice? This is Talk TV. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know, uh, it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Good afternoon to you. This is Talk TV with me, Julia hartley Brewer on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Philip Ingram still with me in the studio. Let's talk right now about what is going on in our schools because I think we all know that if you're looking for a school for your kid, one of the first things you look at is the Ofsted inspection. But in recent years, being big question marks about those Ofsted inspections because, of course, teachers don't really want to be inspected. Apparently, it's all very stressful. It's not very accurate. And with the terrible, sad uh, death, the suicide of a primary school head teacher, Ruth Perry, during her... T um, uh, uh, during, uh, uh, well, soon, soon after an Ofsted inspection, which uh, took her from a high, high, high rating to a very low rating. Big question marks have been raised uh, about this issue. Now, uh, the former head of Ofsted, Amanda Spielman, she was in office when this sad, tragic suicide took place. She said that Britain is becoming a dangerous place where it's impossible to have a difficult conversation. And she defended her actions after Ruth Perry's death. Uh, and she said there was often too much focus on being kind to adults working in public services rather than concern for those using those public services, such as children who are pupils in those schools. Well, let's talk about this right now with um, Steve Chalk. He's the founder of the Oasis Trust, uh, which incorporates 52 different academies across England. Uh, good afternoon to you, Steve. Hi, Julia. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I have to say, I was quite horrified um, when the news emerged about the claims that Ruth Perry, a, a, a teacher, had taken her own life as a result of an offset inspection. I was horrified that anyone would take their own life in those circumstances, obviously. But I was also horrified that the reaction seemed to be in the political and teaching world. Oh, well, in that case, offset inspections are a bad thing. We must change everything because of this woman's tragic death. I thought that was a complete overreaction and indeed the complete wrong reaction. We need Ofsted inspections, do we not? We need a body that comes in and says to schools and teachers and head teachers whether they're doing a good job or not doing a good job because parents and pupils aren't in a position to make those judgments. So would you agree that we still need to have a body that comes in and inspects schools? Absolutely. So every school needs regulation, doesn't it? Every school needs inspection. Every business needs inspection. We all need to be accountable. I guess there are accountability structures built into your job, Julia. Without Oh, God, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Without accountability, we're all lost. The, the, the issue is the nature yeah. of that, isn't there? After Ruth Perry committed suicide, as you know, there was a... a, a great deal of uh, hand-wringing about what had happened and then the new inspector a uh, chief inspector uh, martin oliver was appointed um, amanda spillman stepped down it was the end of her term anyway and martin oliver stepped up at the beginning of this new year and the first thing uh, martin oliver did is he said we're going to pause offset inspections yeah. and we're going to give all of our all of our inspectors training in how to spot stress and how to spot tension. And I chuckled about that because the truth is we run actually 54 schools now. Any Ofsted inspection or inspection of any kind is stress inducing, isn't yeah. it? So and it should be. Want... Yeah, exactly. So that's the point. 
that the, the whole thing induces stress and anxiety. What you've got to do, though, I think, is reform. To, well, I've got a friend who was responsible for a regulator in this country. Uh, it, it was to do with nuclear power mm -hmm. until very recently. And he said, we have to keep, uh, we have to hold our power stations to account. We've got to hold them to account. If they get this wrong, we blow up half the country. Yeah. And then he said to me, therefore, we would never inspect in the way that Ofsted does. We come and we hold people to account, but we come with support as well. We're a team, the inspection team and the team working in any nuclear power station. We're a team together. We tell them what needs to change. They tell us what their issues are, yeah. what their starting place is, and we both go away with tasks to do. Right, so it's, so it's more yeah. collaborative rather than someone standing in the corner of the classroom. I can still remember when I was at, at school and my comp, and you'd have the inspector in, and we were just being, they would, the teachers would beg us, for the love of God, behave in this one class when this inspector's in. But, you know, they'd be standing there and they'll watch, or sitting there in the corners watching, and they're probably not getting the most sort of, accurate view of what's going on but this thing a collaborative approach would definitely be the case but i mean at the end of the day there are an awful lot of parents who think their local school is really good i know i i know someone whose job it was to close down failing schools and to get rid of all the teachers and the heads and 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 the teach and the parents would be out there with their placards saying save our school no idea that this is a rubbish school and their children are being horribly horribly failed because they've got nothing to weigh it up against so we do need people who come in independently but Surely any teacher or head teacher who thinks they're doing a good job shouldn't be that afraid. In the same way that if I've not revised for an exam, I'm going to be more stressed about it than if I think, no, I've done the work, I've done the revision, I'm, 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 it's going to be stressful, but I can handle that stress. Surely yeah. good teachers, good head teachers are not terrified of an Ofsted inspection. Well, I, I understand the point you're making, but I do think it's slightly more complicated than that because the question is... What are the quest what are the inspectors coming in to look for and what are yeah. the starting places? So, for instance, um, I don't know if you know what uh, parents will know what an EHCP is. It's an education health uh, care plan. And so children who are on the autistic spectrum or have some other learning uh, 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 difference, they're neurodivergent, they can apply and they can get an EHCP to help them with their education. But they may not be, well, they won't be typical learners for their age. They may be behind for their age because yeah. they, they, so the Ofsted inspectors don't build that into yeah. their inspection. Now, what happens is some schools find ways of not having children with the HCPs on in, in their cohort. So if you look at schools in a town you might get a school that does very very well at gcse's um and on all the criteria it's marked on by ofsted but when you dig and say so how many children do they have who are not typical learners in their school you find they've got one percent yeah so of course they're doing the better road, i've also yeah, seen other schools some schools which have got you know they've done they're doing really well in terms of you know the children's learning and everything like that but they but they haven't ticked all the boxes on a, an anti-bullying policy so some of the paperwork yes. isn't and that's the stuff that you know look of course we don't want the school to have bullying i've seen plenty of schools i've spoken to parents over the years who've got a school that's got all the tick boxes done they're absolutely fine anti-bullying but their kids being bullied and no one's doing anything about it so much of this is down to someone being in the school for perhaps a few weeks and getting the feel of the school i remember reading some Ofsted reports saying you know this is the school where you know the head teacher knows every child's name and you can see their interaction between the children and the teachers that there is clearly sort of trust and and kindness and and you know that goes a long way towards better learning but but it doesn't replace good exactly. learning yeah, but it's part of good learning, isn't yeah. it? It's part of yeah. good learning for life. And what about the school down the road that's got 30% of children on EHCPs yeah. as opposed to the school with 1% because they didn't let those kids in yeah. and yet they're being judged by the same measure. Here's so the I thing, though, those... Steve. An awful lot yeah. of us parents go out of our way, whether it's uh, by m people move to a, a, a catchment area of a good school or they try and get their kids to, to get into a grammar school if that's available, or like me, bought, away, bought my way out of the system. To basically go out of my way to make sure my kid isn't at school with those kids and those uh, 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 with those learning dis difficulties, whatever they are, result from, so that their kid is not held back and their kid can learn. Does that make us all selfish? 
I think, I think in actual fact, society is about mixing with people who are not like you. And that's part of yeah. an education, which makes you a good and rounded person, doesn't yeah. it? Somebody who's able to contribute to society. And so, of course, we all want the best education for our children. But there's a big question that we could have about what is the best education? Is it just academic attainment or is it something a little bit more fulfilling in life than that? It's, it's really interesting, I, I'm sure you know this, that some of the highest suicide rates amongst young people in the country are where we have um, uh, Russell Group universities, Oxford, Cambridge, etc. So we can put kids through a pressure cooker which doesn't equip them for wider life. High, high How achieving, many... yeah. 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 No, I completely understand. Just fine, I just want to ask you, um, National Education Union, there might be balloting mm -hmm. for whether or not they go back on strike. What impact will that have on you at your, at your well, schools? It, well, it, it, it will have, it have it, a different impact in different parts of the country. So the NEU are stronger in the big cities uh, than they are uh, in other parts of the country. So some of our schools will be crippled if they go on strike. Some of them hardly affected, depending okay. which union teachers belong to. But I do think that underneath it all, we ought to hear something else. It is that, as you know, there's a, there's, there's a huge gap in the number of teachers we're recruiting nationally. There's a huge gap in the number of teachers specifically around sciences. There's a huge gap in retainment yeah. and people 40% of teachers leave the profession within five years. That should be a wake-up call to us about addressing this whole inspection thing differently. But inspection is needed. Indeed. Really appreciate you joining us. Steve Chalk there, founder of the Oasis Trust. Uh, they've got 54 uh, different uh, uh, schools, uh, academies across England. Um, Philip Ingram, you're still with me in the studio. Um, what kind of school did you go to? What kind of school did your kids go to? How would you feel about inspections? Well, I went to what was called a voluntary grammar school because it was yeah. it was Northern Ireland, so you're state funded, uh, but it it they uh, kept the grammar system. It, it in Northern kept the grammar Ireland. system yeah. uh, where I was. So I was I was very lucky. Um, inspections are important. You, you need to be able to hold. Um, organizations to account and make sure there's common standards amongst the different organizations so that people are being looked after but you have to understand what the purpose of an inspection is and if it's to improve things if it's to keep things working kids. work from a collaborative perspective yeah. don't work from a um, i'm marking you um, out of out of 10 and if you don't get yeah. above we, five we should all be on the same side yeah. and that same side is making sure kids get a great education but i do think the children should be prioritized over the feelings of the teachers oh, or very, the head teachers. Very, very very much um, so let's go back uh, to our question we're putting to you today about uh, the uh, UK's approach to Israel. I'm asking, should the Prime Minister here take a tougher approach uh, to Israel? This uh, after the Prime Minister demanded an investigation into the Israeli airstrike that killed three British aid workers in Gaza, among seven who died. And has got in touch. Uh, you can get in touch, say, uh, on the phone, so 344 499 1000. You can uh, WhatsApp on that number. You can text 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. And says, in combat zones, mistakes are made, especially in an urban environment such as Gaza. These aid workers knew the risks were high when they willingly decided to enter theatre of war. Nick says it's out of the PM's wage bracket. He's not doing the job here properly, let alone start interfering with things abroad. Charles agrees. He says England should mind its own business and sort its own problems out. If aid workers want to go to these places, they should know the risks. Uh, Karen says he should put an immediate arms embargo on and enforce sanctions until there is a ceasefire. Uh, right, well, let's go to the phones. Charles is in Darlington. Charles, what do you think? Um, well, you, yeah, I think you're about the only one who's giving a really fair and balanced account. I think also earlier on you had a young lady on from Scotland who was forever saying, but there must be a better way. There yes. must, nobody can tell you what it is. And people are forgetting. They need a history lesson. Israel pulled out of Gaza in 2005. They forced all their own people out yep. and made sure that the, the Gaza people, the Palestinians, could have Gaza. They put Hamas in. And from 2007 onwards, Hamas were taking billions of aid, building their tunnels and rockets. Yeah. And this didn't start on October the 7th. Israel have been having rockets fired at them daily from, from the Gaza Strip. And they've done what they can to fight back without going into Gaza. And it was only after October the 7th they went into Gaza. I think Israel, if Israel weren't doing so much to try and prevent um, civilian casualties, perhaps they'd have got it over with a lot quicker. 
they could have gone in a lot heavier. Yes, there's so, lots of talk about actually that what they're doing actually enables Hamas to sort of you know kind of stay afloat because they're doing. It. But do you think that we are kind of in the West? We're like, well, there's any civilian death that's awful. I mean, it is. It is awful. These these you know innocent children, you know, in particular, you know, they didn't start this war. Even if they've been radicalized to think that you know Hamas is is this their savior, they you know it's not their fault. Should should Israel be doing more though? Should the West be encouraging them to do more to try and save those civilian lives, particularly in terms of getting aid in for for um, for, you know for these malnourished mal uh, civilians? Uh, yeah, I don't see what more they can do. They need to defeat Hamas. Otherwise, I mean, and they, and they also remember something else that a great Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir said: the wars between Israel and the Palestinians will continue until the Palestinians start to love their own children more than they hate the Jews. Oh, yes. I think you've nailed it there, uh, Charles in Darlington. Thank you very much indeed. 12.45 is the time. Uh, up next, we are going to talk about Jet Zero. Yes, net zero when it comes to our flights. And a committee of MPs who say we should be charging frequent flyers more taxes to stop them flying. I wonder how many of those MPs have taken a business class flight on your or my paycheck. We'll talk about that up next. This is Talk. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All right, right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another that. era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Good afternoon. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. This is Talk. We're on TV, on radio, online, on your smart speaker. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. Um, just before we go to our next topic, just uh, um, breaking news in the last hour or so, the family of the British aid worker John Chapman, among the three uh, British aid workers, among the seven who were killed in that Israeli airstrike in Gaza, uh, they have issued a statement saying he will forever be a hero, adding that he died trying to help people. Certainly, whatever one thinks about events in Gaza. <laughs> Excuse me, apologies, trying to not sneeze while I'm on air. Um, uh, you know, these people were certainly heroes. Uh, working in such a dangerous war zone, bringing aid uh, to civilians. Right now, let's turn our attention to something completely different. We talk a lot about net zero on this show. Now let's talk about jet zero. There is genuinely a policy called jet zero. The idea is to make uh, all flights carbon neutral by whatever ridiculous uh, time zone. Uh, there is currently a jet zero strategy. It's working to cut emissions. It's expected to see a first review in 2027. Now, the Environmental Audit Committee, which is a committee of MPs, cross-party in the House of Commons, have issued a new report urging the government to bring forward this review to next year to determine whether the sector remains on track to meet a 2050 net zero target. I'm going to guess that it doesn't. And they're calling on ministers to prepare for the review and perhaps, well, deliver measures that if the technology can't be changed, the fuel can't be made cleaner to make air travel uh, net uh, zero, then we'll have to impose taxes to stop people flying so much. So frequent flyers would face higher taxes in the way that people travelling business class and uh, a first class uh, get uh, pay higher taxes than those of us sitting in the economy section. Well, let's talk about this with our old friend, Donica McCarthy, who's director at Climate Media Coalition. Good afternoon to you, Donica. Good afternoon, Julia. I'm even older than I was when I last saw you. <laughs> oh, we're, all, we're all getting older. Now, one thing I did love the fact that I did look up this committee, uh, and, and there's a subcommittee as part of the Environmental Audit Committee, and they went on a lovely little trip to Antarctica in January, one of those fact-finding missions we hear so much about. I don't know how they would have got all the way to Antarctica without going on a flight, but I'm sure it was vitally necessary. They couldn't have read a book or looked at pictures or done a Zoom meeting. They had to be there to look at the ice themselves. But, you know, a lot of us that like to take fly flights, I get an awful lot of them. Should people be penalised for being frequent flyers? I think there, there's a real issue with the people taking numerous flights. 15% um, of the population takes 70% of the flights, Julia. 50% of the UK population doesn't take any flight in a particular year. And the rest of us pay the price for those flights. Do we? Um, How do we pay the price? Well, local, uh, there's a million people in London uh, suffer from noise pollution from the airports in London. The children in the schools surrounding the airports suffer from um, uh, fossil fuel pollution coming down out of the air into them. And of course, then there's the climate impacts. 7% of our total impacts are from aviation. We have to tackle this one if we're going to tackle but, it seriously. But this, this implies that an awful lot of the flying <clears throat> that is going on, the flights that take off, are all just you know people like me you know, swanning off to the Alps for, for a ski trip. Actually, a lot of these flights are carrying vital cargo. They are providing jobs. I mean, lot, the, people, the people who live closest to the biggest airport who, uh, who uh, are, are hearing that getting the noise pollution are also the people likely to be working at the airports or benefiting uh, from the jobs provided by those airports. There's not a million people working in Heathrow, Julia. There are an awful lot of people who benefit from the jobs that Heathrow brings. No, you're actually right. I mean, we're actually you're actually right. If you care about jobs, you need to talk about jobs in relation to the tourism industry. The fact is, the UK tourism industry is a net loss to the G, to the global to the UK economy of twenty five billion pounds. No, it's not. The rich people no, it's like not. people you coming you. into this yeah, country, Donica. People coming into this country, spending money in our hotels, in our restaurants, in the theatre, um, you know, and, and all and the taxis and all the other things that do in the in the shops. That's not a net loss. No, we benefit no, no, from no, tourism. Really. Hang on. You need to understand that what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the amount of money frequent flyers and people holidaying abroad spend abroad and how much people from abroad spend in the UK. <laughs> we spend 25 billion more abroad than tourists visiting this country. So what do you mean? You're, say you're saying that I will spend that money here rather than spending it abroad. That's a load of nonsense because I wouldn't There's because I wouldn't spend billion. that amount of money to sit on a beach in England or to, to slide down a mountain in Wales. Well, that's, well, if you don't want, if you don't, if you're not patriotic enough, that you don't think well, Britain's not patriotic a, enough. Holidays, How isn't? dare I seek you out sea said, and sand just... and sunshine or snow? You've How just... dare I? <laughs> 
You've just dish Britain as a holiday resort. I mean, how can you, Julia? I think, I think people come to Don't Britain for holidays Britain? for different reasons than I choose. I live in the greatest city on earth, in my view, but I, I go and visit other cities. I go and do other things. But I also, I also want to get things like guaranteed sunshine or guaranteed snow. And I'm afraid you can't get those here in the UK. So what you're actually saying is that, uh, unlike me, I actually love Britain for holidays oh. and I actually spend my money in Britain. And it Just does two it, it improves the British economy and it cuts carbon emissions. It's a win-win, Julia. I, well, you know, I couldn't oh, care less about I. carbon emissions. I'd rather go on my you holiday like Britain. most people would. Here's the thing. Should we be penalising people? There's been some thought about, OK, you can have to tax people to stop them from flying, bearing in mind those flights are, are often used for cargo and actually very useful for, for our, our economy. But are you saying oh, that, for sorry, instance, people should be allowed to take maybe one or two foreign holidays a year and everything after that they should be penalized to try and stop them do you think they'll do it because it seems to me if we did do something like that you're basically saying hey rich people you can fly as much as you want but everyone else well to hell with you no no it's not it's actually saying that the the, the family that goes on a holiday to to spain will stay will pay no extra on that one holiday but the person who lives in 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 with their holiday home in greece and flies out 10 or 12 times a year that they get hammered that's right an idea <laughs> that sounds wonderful i hadn't thought of that yeah but 12 what? flights a year the price that the people in london are paying for the pollution and for the noise and the climate impacts is intolerable we need to check you we know need that to the air the did you know that the, the air in well. london you're talking specifically about london the air in london that has got cleaner in recent not just in recent years every decade every year since you know 1900 the air has got cleaner well if you look at the um the, the pollution hotspots in london obviously it's london and it's around heathrow airport why is it around Heathrow airport because the number of flights are going through the roof the air's there. Got cleaner. because we've got people there are more flights but the air's got the air cleaner the other thing i thought that was very interesting about okay, the report quickly. Very interesting on board is that they said that we need to make trains cheaper. And I'm thinking that's something that we need to be doing in the UK. Over the yeah. last 12 years, we've increased planes for train fares above inflation and we've reduced plane fares. That's okay, nice. no, that's a good point. Well, again, exactly. It's largely richer people who get trains. Donna and McCarthy, always good to Thank you very much. Final word to Philip Ingram on this. He's been joining us in the studio for the whole show. Well, I say most frequent flyers are business flyers and they're bringing business into this country. So it's money Can't coming into the country. Can't do everything on Zoom. So, so you, you, you tax them even more. What's going to tax business? Yeah, or, or they're the up. very rich, and the very rich, as I have to say, my idea of hell would be be flying. Well, the very rich have got their own. I've got their own. I've got their own aircraft. Yeah, so I'm, just, get these I'm just saying, and if you are very rich <laughs> and you'd like to frequent fly with me, I'm very happy to come <laughs> on board. Always happy to take part. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining me. This has been talked. We're on TV, on radio, online, on your smart speaker. Alex uh, and Kev are up next. I'm Julia Hartley Booth. Back with you tomorrow. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, oh! It's carry on what just 